To kick this backpacking 101 course off right, we're gonna start at the beginning, as one often does. And as with all manner of outdoor pursuits, of the beginning just happens to be the seven principles of Leave No Trace. To know them is to love them. To love them is to follow them. Now, if you've already spent a fair amount of time in the outdoors or amongst other outdoorsy folks, you're likely already familiar with Leave No Trace. But a refresher is never a bad thing. And if you've never heard of these so-called principles, well then you're in for a treat, because these seven guidelines are the most important set of principles to keep in mind anytime you're enjoying the outdoors, especially when backpacking. They are guidelines to live by in order to help ensure that not only you, but everyone else out there can have a safe, sustainable, responsible, and a totally baller time outside. So let's dive into the seven principles of Leave No Trace and break down how to adhere to them when enjoying any and all outdoor places and spaces, shall we? Number one is plan ahead and prepare. The very first principle is first for a reason, as it often is. Cause you know the saying, if you fail to plan, you plan to fail. So true. But what does that mean when we're talking about backpacking? For starters, you plan by charting your route, uh, checking the weather, researching water sources and campfire restrictions, calculating how many nights you'll be in the backcountry and how much food you'll need. Likewise, you'll need to plan how you'll cook, where you'll sleep, what you'll do with your trash, uh, pack it out, obviously, and how you'll navigate. Once you have a detailed plan, you'll need to prepare for your excursion by packing the right layers, an appropriate amount of food and water, a first aid kit, and any tools unique to the destination or terrain. Because a well-planned trip means a safe and enjoyable trip for everyone, and one that leaves no trace that you were ever there to begin with. See <laughs> what we did there? Leave no trace. <laughs> if all that seemed like a lot of vague, overview -y nonsense, don't worry, we'll break down all of this in more detail in upcoming lessons. We got you. Number two is travel and camp on durable surfaces. This is the second principle of leave no trace because your big old feet have real potential to trample everything and mess it all up. So this guideline admonishes you to stay on designated trails when hiking and backpacking. That means no cutting switchbacks. And when you camp, set up in designated campsites. Again, more on that in a later lesson, but for now, here's the concise version. Pitch your tent on durable surfaces like dirt, gravel, or a big old boulder if you can, and choose spots that have clearly already been used for camping if at all possible. How will you know if it's a designated campsite when you're in the backcountry? If there's a permanent fire ring present, that's a pretty good indicator that that's where you're supposed to pitch your tent. Now when you're hiking, walk in a way that tramples the least amount of delicate underfoot foliage. That means no single file lines if you're hiking in a group of two or more. Why? You'll start to wear a path where there shouldn't be one, that's why. So if you're in a group and you're in true wilderness areas where there's no trail, spread out. Give each other space. If there is a trail, absolutely stay on it. Especially if you're in an area with cryptobiotic crust or living soil, which is found mostly in the Western states. One step on that stuff and you could completely destroy a delicate living ecosystem. If you're not sure if there's living soil where you're headed, then ask a park ranger or a guide from the area. Even if the ground is just flowers and grass, if you trample it, especially if the next hiker does too, and the hiker after that and so on, it may never grow back, thus decimating the landscape for other living creatures that might depend on it. So watch where you put your feet and remember, leave no trace. The next principle is dispose of waste properly. You heard me. If you packed it in, you pack it out. All of it. That obviously means trash like food wrappers, but also fruit and vegetable skins, peels, dropped trail mix, all of it. Because no, just because it's natural doesn't mean it's going to magically decompose overnight. In fact, food scraps, in addition to just being unsightly for other hikers, have dangerous potential to attract wildlife who could either get sick from eating said scraps or get too acclimated to people food and thus people and become aggressive. So pack out that apple core, but also your own excrement. 
Okay, all right. Granted, you don't always have to pack out your own poo, but you must if you're backpacking or hiking in a rocky river canyon or an area where you can't feasibly dig a cat hole, like in frozen tundra where the earth is just too hard to dig or in an area composed of all boulders and rocks, like the desert. In these cases, you'll have to bring a thick opaque bag or two with you and poo into those. Put TP in there also, please. You can buy these wag bags at outdoor stores built for that purpose, but dog waste bags work too, as do zip top bags covered in duct tape, because you really don't want to see through that stuff. If you're in the woods or places with diggable earth, then you can usually deposit your waste and toilet paper in a hole six to eight inches deep. Just make sure you cover it up before you walk away. And ensure you dig that hole at least 200 feet away from natural water sources and campsites. Because uh, not only is that gross, but it could contaminate the drinking water and make everyone else really sick. We'll put a link to a bonus video on how to poop in the woods <laughs> below. As for toilet paper, don't even think about leaving it in the bushes or at the base of a tree. Even if you only went number one and didn't have to dig a hole. Nothing mucks up the beauty of nature more than little white squares littering the side of the trail or campsite. So pack it out, use leaves, or get yourself a reusable pea cloth. <laughs> Whatever you do, don't forget your ultralight spade. And in case you were wondering, yes, this goes for your pet's waste too. Next up, leave what you find. We've all done it. Found a cool fossil, rock, flower, maybe even an old railroad spike or something, and taken it home with us. But when you're backpacking, make a point to leave it where you found it. Sure, it's cool, and there may even be a million of those fossils, rocks, flowers, railroad spikes. But if you take one, and the next person takes one, and the next person, well, there won't be any left for others to enjoy now, will there? Plus, native wildlife may need that stuff for food or nests, so you could be depriving them of sustenance or accessible housing. And you don't want to be that jerk, do you? So instead of taking it, pick it up, examine it, take a photo, make a sketch, do whatever the heck it is you do, but then set it back down and walk away. And let somebody else experience the same joy of discovery that you did. Next up is minimize campfire impacts, and this principle is a big one. Smokey Bear says, only you can prevent wildfires. But responsible fire building is about so much more than not burning down the forest. It's about minimizing impact too. So when you build a fire in the outdoors, do it so it doesn't leave a trace. For starters, always obey park rules. As in, if a ranger or park sign says you're not allowed to have a campfire, then don't have a campfire. Easy as. More and more destinations are implementing burn bans these days, so if you're west of the Mississippi, Ah, don't necessarily count on having a campfire every night. But if you are permitted to burn stuff, which is obviously super fun, keep it in the fire pit if there is one. Keep it small and contained, and if you'll be collecting wood, make sure you're only collecting dead and downed wood, as in wood you find on the ground that's fully dried out. To tell if it's dead, it should break, not bend, when pressure is applied. Bending indicates that it's still green or alive and won't make good firewood anyway. As for what size branches to use, they shouldn't be bigger around than an average person's wrist. Maybe slightly bigger than mine would be okay. I wouldn't call that average. These will not only be easier to snap in half, but smaller branches burn more completely to ash, reducing the chances that leftover hot coals will spontaneously combust after you depart or go to bed. It happens. If your site looks pretty barren of usable, burnable stuff, then take a walk to look for wood especially if you're in a popular campsite area where downed wood may have been pretty well scavenged already. Whatever you do, never cut down or break off branches or trees in order to build a fire. Just don't do it, okay? As for the actual fire itself, build it on a durable surface so you won't damage the ground beneath the coals, clear the area of loose dry debris like sticks and leaves, and make sure there aren't any low branches hanging right over the fire. For more info, check out the fire building instructional video we shot, which we'll link to below. And don't ever leave your fire unattended. If you go to bed or leave camp for the day, douse that bad boy so thoroughly you can stick your hand on the soggy coals. Seriously. Next up is respect wildlife, as in keep your dang distance. I mean, think of it this way. How would you like it if you were in your natural habitat just trying to work and enjoy your coffee in Starbucks and some rando tourists kept inching closer and closer and closer as they tried to snap a selfie? I personally wouldn't care for it very much. I might even get angry enough to charge at them. 
or I don't know, at least throw an ice cube or two for my cold brew? Well, that's how animals feel when people invade their space just so they can get a better look or take that envy-inducing selfie for Instagram. So stay back and give animals their space so you don't send them fleeing to the woods or sprinting toward you in rage while they're just trying to enjoy their breakfast. Stay 25 yards away from animals like deer, moose, and bison, and at least 100 yards from bears, mountain lions, and wolves. Or you might get trampled. Even if you don't, you could be acclimatizing them to people, which is just as dangerous for them. And never feed animals, any of them. Nope, not even the cute little chipmunks or birds eye in your blanket during a picnic. People food can kill animals. Maybe not right away, but it doesn't contain the nutrition they need. Their bodies may not be able to digest it, and they may have to be euthanized if they get too reliant on people food and develop aggressive behaviors. In short, a fed animal is a dead animal, so don't do it. Plus, it teaches them bad manners, and they go and annoy everybody else in the vicinity. I mean, seagulls, am I right? Now, that goes for accidental feedings, too. The kind where you don't properly store your food in your car or a bear box when you're camping or when you leave a bag of unattended chips on a picnic table and animals pilfer your supplies. That's a bummer for everyone involved because now raccoons or worse bears know the campground is a place they can get a free meal and well you're missing four sandwiches. The final leave no trace principle is about people because being considerate of other hikers is just as important as everything else. But what does that look like? Usually it means it's time to turn off your music, at least when others are within earshot, turn down your voice, unless you're in grizzly country, then wear your little lungs out, and offer the right of way to other hikers. Start by leaving your Bluetooth speaker at home. If you must have music when you hike, then use earbuds. Then, if conversing with other hikers, use your inside voice. Yep, even when outside. Some people are out here to observe wildlife or find a moment of peace and quiet, so don't be the one to ruin it for them. Finally, offer to yield the path to anyone hiking faster than you. Coming from the opposite direction or going uphill, it's just polite. Now, we're not telling you how you need to enjoy the outdoors. The point is just to be considerate of the people around you and that they may not love your music as much as you do. And don't be afraid to say hello or offer advice for where to spot a rare flower or a colorful lizard when you cross paths with others. Outdoorsy folks often enjoy a chat as much as anybody. Think you can manage these seven principles? <laughs> we have faith in you. Remember that they're guidelines, not rules, for you rebels who hate rules, and following them creates a more beautiful, welcoming, sustainable environment for not only fellow outdoor enthusiasts, but the plants and animals who call the great outdoors home. Listen, nobody's perfect and we all mess up on these from time to time, but the point of the principles is to help us all do our best so we can enjoy public lands together and for a long time to come. So leave no trace when you head outside and wander on. To the next lesson. Next up, trip planning. You've gathered your gear, you requested time off work, and you're ready to start planning your first backpacking trip. You're probably pretty stoked. But where do you even begin? Well, let's talk about it. Trip planning is a huge part of preparing for your first or any backpacking trip. Every adventure requires a plan. I mean, it's the first rule of leave no trace after all, which you know. Because as the saying goes, if you fail to plan, you plan to fail. And failing can be disastrous in the great outdoors. So it's extra important to know well before you set out where you're going, how long it will take you, and if there are any special items you need to bring with you that are unique to the destination. For example, if you are traveling in some regions of Canada, Alaska, and the Pacific Northwest, you will want to carry bear spray and a bear canister to store your food. Some parks even require it. In other destinations, like desert regions, you need to plan to pack in all of your water for your entire trip as there may not be any natural water sources along your route. On more popular trails, like along the Appalachian Trail, you may be just a short walk from civilization every couple of days and can restock food and supplies anytime so you won't need to pack as much. And in other regions, you absolutely must have a permit in order to camp overnight. Knowing all of this in advance is important for a successful and enjoyable trip. But let's start from the beginning. Selecting where to hike. 
If you don't already have a trail or hike in mind, there are a number of tools to locate one that suits you. Naturally, you can use sites like OutsideMag.com or Backpacker.com, local hiking blogs, even local outdoor stores. But we also love using trail finding apps like All Trails, Onyx Backcountry, and Gaia. These will help you not only find trails that suit your skill and ability levels, but you can also look at photos, read other backpackers reviews, and use the apps as digital maps to help you track your progress. But more on digital maps in a later lesson. As you search for trails, keep your expectations, physical abilities, and desires in mind in order to have the most enjoyable experience. For example, if you know you love waterfalls and epic views, don't pick a trail that's in a desert canyon or meanders through dense woods the whole time. It's okay and even encouraged to select your hikes based on what you enjoy and what you hope to get out of them. I mean, this is your trip. But you should also take terrain into account. For example, if you haven't been exercising or training for backpacking lately, more on that in a future lesson too, you probably won't enjoy a trip that involves a significant amount of elevation gain and loss. Your body will hurt, you will be tired, and nothing will seem terribly enjoyable. Trust me, I've been there. If, on the other hand, you are like me and love to be challenged, you may find a long, wide, flat trail incredibly boring and frustrating. Bottom line, take what you like and what you are physically capable of into consideration when selecting a route, and you'll have a much better time when you're out there. Then, make sure to research the permit process. Because part of picking a trail or a destination or a park is researching whether you need a permit. Some places require them, others don't. Some parks let you pay for a permit and reserve backcountry sites the same day you're hoping to start your trip. Others require you to plan your whole route and get a permit months in advance. Sometimes they're free, other times you're gonna have to drop a pretty penny. So whether you're headed to a national park, forest, or wilderness area, check to see if you need a permit to spend the night in the backcountry. A quick internet search will probably tell you, but local outdoor store employees are often in the know too. You can also call a ranger station for more info. Now, we'll talk in much more detail about food and water in a future lesson, but for now, let's discuss how to know how much to pack after you've selected your route. Generally speaking, the average person will need about 3,000 calories per day while backpacking, give or take. Now, the exact amount varies greatly and largely depends on your size and weight, how strenuous the trail is, your metabolism, and more. But plan on eating more than you usually would on a day-to-day -day basis. Want a more dialed-in estimate? We have a calorie calculator on terradrift.com to help you figure out how many calories you should eat per day of hiking all things considered. Once you have that number in mind, reference it often while preparing or purchasing backpacking meals for your trip. Then bring more food with you than you think you need. It will likely take time and practice to pinpoint the sweet spot between too little and too much food, but always err on the side of too much. I've personally brought too much and too little on backpacking trips before, and while I might complain about the extra weight of too much trail mix, packing too little has led to rationed snacking, something you never want on a backpacking trip, going to bed hungry, and mild panic. So just pack the extra trail mix. How much water should you bring? Use maps, trail reviews, and parks departments to find out whether or not there will be water available along your route. That's a great place to start. For example, you may be crossing over multiple trailheads or developed campgrounds along the way that have water spigots available where you can refill as you hike. Or you may be hiking in a place with only natural water sources like creeks, lakes, and ponds. If that's the case, take extra care to ensure that those natural water sources actually contain water before relying on them for all of your hydration needs. The last thing you want is to assume a creek is running, have little to no water when you get there, and then the creek be completely dry because the area is in drought. This is where up-to-date trail reviews and parks departments or forestry services come in handy. Again, they're always handy, I don't know. More than once we have called up a permitting office to ask whether or not we should expect there to be water in a natural feature along a trail. Occasionally we have discovered that we cannot rely on that water source and that we do in fact need to carry in all of the water we need for the trip. But if you will be refilling at natural water sources, don't forget 
forget that you'll need to filter and purify that water, but more on that in a future lesson. Just make sure you have a plan for water as well as food and that you will never be in danger of running dry while in the backcountry. And keep in mind that the average person should drink approximately one liter of water per two hours of hiking. More if it's exceedingly hot and dry or the hike is especially strenuous. Plus, you know, more for cooking and hot drinks. And don't forget about electrolytes and salty snacks. We'll talk more about the importance of those things in a later lesson, but never pack just water, especially when it's hot. Your body needs that salt too. Moving on. While you're planning your trip, don't forget to take transportation into consideration. Meaning, how are you getting to the trailhead to start your trip, and how are you getting back after a long one-way hike? For example, if you are driving to the trailhead and hiking a loop trail that begins and ends at the same spot, all you may need to do is check to make sure that there is parking available and research whether that parking lot regularly fills up by a certain time, which might prevent you from starting on schedule or at the location you initially planned upon. It's also important to know if you'll need a high clearance or four-wheel drive vehicle to reach the trailhead, or if the road has been flooded or blocked by downed trees. Trail reviews, forums, and park services departments can often give you an idea of whether or not any of these things could be an issue. So if you can't find the info online, call up the local land management office, whether it's a national or state park or public land, also known as Bureau of Land Management or BLM land, which is managed by the Forestry Service. If you're hiking point to point, meaning a long one-way trail where you won't be returning to the same trailhead at which you started, some sort of transportation may need to be organized. That could be as simple as asking a friend or family member to pick you up and shuttle you back to the start, or as complicated as organizing car key swaps with hikers going in the opposite direction, which you can do on hiking forums, via community bulletin boards, or on social media platforms. We've also hitchhiked back to the trailhead after a long one way hike. Not everyone is comfortable doing that, but we find that, especially in national parks, a friendly outdoorsy person or family is almost always willing to give you a ride. Especially if you stop to chat with them at some point along the trail. So be friendly while you're out there. It just might pay off. Some more popular one-way trails also offer shuttles from high traffic start and end points, and at others you may even be able to hail an Uber. But the key is to plan ahead and have your transportation situation dialed in. But let's talk about trip planning from a timing and distance perspective. As in, planning for how long the hike will actually take, keeping in mind that Distance does not always directly correlate to time required. Now, we'll talk more about reading a map and better estimating timing based on topography in a later lesson, but for now, know that a six mile day is not a six mile day is not a six mile day. Six miles can look and feel vastly different depending on conditions like elevation change, heat, the weight of your pack, altitude, and your relative hiking speed. There really isn't a way to automatically make an accurate guess as to how long six miles will take on any given hike, but when you're new to route planning, you can start by estimating that your hiking speed will likely be about 1.5 miles per hour. You may hike much faster than that. I usually do. Even on steep and arduous terrain, I often average closer to two miles per hour, more on flat trails in cooler or more temperate climates. But for the sake of planning your route and making an estimate regarding when you will finish, err on the side of taking your time. Don't try to overextend yourself, especially when you're new to backpacking. You'll learn soon enough what six miles feels like on different types of terrain and in different climates. Don't rush it. But in the beginning, give yourself plenty of time so you don't end up trying to race the sun to the campground in order to set up your tent before it gets dark. Honestly, that just takes a lot of fun out of the experience and makes it immensely more stressful. Listen, trust me, I know. So start by figuring out how many hours you have to hike, not that you need to hike for that many hours. Do so by figuring out sunrise and sunset. The number of hours in between is your daylight hiking window, or how many hours you have to cover whatever distance you have in mind. To figure out how long it will actually take to hike from point A to point B, locate on the map your starting and ending points, which may include trailheads or campgrounds. Take note of the distance and divide it by your average hiking time. 
1.5 miles per hour or one mile per hour if you know you like to take your time or take frequent breaks. That's how much time you have to hike. But you don't have to finish at sunset. If you'd like to finish hiking at least one hour before sunset or two, four, whatever, use that time as the end of your hiking window. Working backward, subtract your estimated hiking time from the end time of your hiking window to decide what time you should start your hike in order to finish it in time. For example, if I'm planning a backpacking trip, I know I like a leisurely breakfast where I can sit, drink my coffee, eat my oatmeal, and take my time packing up to go. And I know I don't like cooking dinner in the dark if it can be avoided. So when I estimate my hiking window, I will probably cut an hour or so out of hiking time in the morning and at least an hour off the end of the day to enjoy sitting around camp during the last bit of daylight. In the summer, let's say that's 7 p.m. So in the summer, that might mean my hiking window is from 9 a.m. to 6 p.m., an hour before I maybe wanna eat. I have 12 miles to cover in a day and I'll average 1.5 miles per hour, meaning my hiking time will probably be around eight hours. Now that I've done the math, I know the latest I should start hiking is 10 a.m. But if I want to give myself extra time to take a dip in a waterfall or explore a side trail, I should start at 9 a.m. instead. Make sense? Math. <gasps> then a great. Do remember, however, to factor in time to rest, eat, and simply sit and enjoy the scenery. You'll enjoy the hike much more if you're not just rushing from point A to point B in order to just get it done. You may have a certain number of hours of daylight available, but that doesn't mean you have to fill them all with activity. But let's move on to planning for weather. Depending on when and where you are hiking, you may need to be prepared for any and all types. So before your trip, check several weather forecasts for the surrounding region to know what sort of clothing and gear you will need to take with you. And don't just check the weather channel. In hard to reach areas far from civilization, like the backcountry, around mountains, at high altitudes, and in the desert, weather forecasts can be dubious at best and can change quickly. So also check park or forestry websites or call into offices to double check. Often they're more familiar with the weather patterns in that area than local meteorologists and can better inform you as to what's expected and what you should bring along. Do remember though that weather is far from an exact science, so it's never a bad idea to bring items like rain jackets or dry bags just in case. Because knowing what to expect weather-wise, especially the forecasted temperature and precipitation, is extremely important when it comes to planning what gear and clothing you will need to bring. As it will not only make your trip more enjoyable, but could literally save your life. Well, guys, that pretty much wraps up trip planning. So go ahead and get started on the next lesson or Go grab yourself a coffee and a PB&J. Take a break. You've earned it. I would like a PB&J. Josh, will you make me a PB&J with bananas? <gasps> apples. No bananas. No apples. Somebody give me a coin. Next up, what to pack. Headed into the great outdoors for some quality time with nature? Gonna sleep under the stars and get sweaty and dirty and eat dinner with a spork while comfortably situated on a fallen log? Yeah, you are. But don't forget to pack the essentials when you head into the wilderness. But don't worry, we've got you covered with this backpacking checklist so you'll never have to ask what to pack for a backcountry camping trip ever again. Let's start with the items you need for safety. A first aid kit that includes moleskin, antihistamine tablets, painkillers, and bandages are all the very minimum you need. A whistle, a mirror for signaling, not primping, a knife or multi-tool, a headlamp or flashlight, insect repellent, sunscreen, reef safe of course, hand sanitizer and or wet wipes, a water purifier and filter, a map and compass, and possibly even a backup battery for your phone, especially if you're using it to read or listen to music or as a map. Nylon cord for hanging a bear bag, and a whole lot more, a bear bag, <laughs> or a stuff sack, several preferably. For sleeping, you're gonna need a tent or hammock, a sleeping bag, a sleeping pad, a packable pillow, and then when it comes time to eat, you're gonna need a camp stove and fuel, cookware with eating utensils, like dishes and cups, obviously, food and water appropriate for the length of the trip, plus a little extra, electrolyte drink mix, mashes and fire starter, extra zip top bags for garbage, and for other things, you're gonna need a cat hole shovel, toilet paper, 
extra dip top bags, again, for garbage and for carrying on your person, a backpacking backpack, obviously, clothing appropriate for the climate you'll be hiking in. We recommend synthetic fabrics, hats like a beanie or a sun hat, hiking shoes or boots and socks, no cotton here, trekking poles, which are optional but recommended, and personal care items like contact solution, a toothbrush, soap, deodorant, etc. You'll also want sunglasses, lip balm with SPF, and a travel towel is handy. A few extras that we like to bring with us that maybe aren't necessarily essentials but really do come in handy is a Kula cloth, which is a reusable antimicrobial pea cloth. They're super handy, okay? A bandana. I like to bring a book with me. I keep it small, don't worry. And maybe a tiny game or two. It's a little dice, perhaps or playing cards. How do we keep it all organized? Stuff sacks. We each use about two per person to keep everything organized and, you know, contained within our backpacks. Now we'll talk more about some of this gear in detail later with recommendations on like how to fit packs and things like that. But for now, join us as we pack our bags for an upcoming adventure. You can kind of get a sneak peek into what we bring with us. Okay, so I'm gonna go through all of the things that I am about to pack into my backpack for um, a few days backpacking adventure. I'm gonna be out there for about four days or so. And honestly, this is pretty much what I would pack no matter how many days I would be out there. Here, we have all of the all of the clothing I need, a couple pairs of socks and underwear and um, one long sleeve shirt, one tank top. We've got a pair of leggings to sleep in, a pair of pants uh, for hiking and a pair of shorts for hiking, plus a um, an ultralight pullover for warmth and a rain jacket. We have my rain cover for my pack down here next to my my pillow, my sleeping pad, my inflatable sleeping pad, um, my one person tent and ground cloth. I've got a little um, packet here for games with my tiny dice. Um, my sun hat is here, a small lightweight travel towel um, for just cleaning up, doing dishes and things, um, drying up spills that, that you know, multi-use. You can use a towel for so many things. Uh, my bladder, which I will fill with water right before I leave. Got my trekking poles, which will also be used to pitch my ultralight tent. Um, I've got my ultralight backpack here from Gossamer Gear. Um, my first aid kit with like insect repellent and um, first aidy things. Matches, of course, which I, I also have a, um, a little igniter for my stove. Some sunscreen. Um, I've got all my bathroom stuff, like my cat hole shovel and um, cool cloth. I have a filter bottle over here that's collapsible from Life Straw. Uh, my BioLite headlamp for evening times. My, uh, my camp shoes, which are uh, my favorite barefoot style zero sandals. They weigh like nothing and take up no space, so I always bring those. Up here I have my cook set. Inside this little package is my is my camp mug and my pot for cooking, uh, plus my pocket rocket stove, um, which I will attach to a canister of fuel once I arrive. Uh, in this bag is all my food and snacks um, for like four or five days. Uh, of course, my sleeping bag and another sleeping pad that I'll probably take with me. Um, it's really nice to have underneath an inflatable sleeping pad, but also just as like a place to sit when you're hanging around camp and just, you know, not doing much or you take a break for lunch or whatever. Have a nice thing to sit on. Not entirely necessary unless it gets really cold. So I may or may not bring it. It may just be for like base camp before backpacking. I'll decide once I get there. But that's it. That's um, pretty much it. Oh yeah, and my my length of um, cord here in case I have to do a bear hang or lash stuff to the outside of my pack, that sort of thing. So that's pretty much what I'm gonna be taking with me on this backpacking trip. Um, I'm, I'm gonna pack it all into my, into that little bag, believe it or not. And uh, we're gonna have a great time. And that's that. That's your backpacking checklist. Too easy, right? Feel free to print it out and reference it often. Every time you go on a trip, in fact. Then pack smart, get out there and wander on. Let's see, what other random nonsense do I pack? Female urination device, occasionally, which only kind of works. So that's just probably completely unnecessary if I'm being honest. My favorite Tilly sun hat. Seriously, they're the best. A battery charger. Honestly, 
I mean, if you're going to use a phone for a map, you're going to want to keep that thing juiced up. So, you know, probably that also. Naturally, if there are any comfort items that you just don't think you can live without, like a backpacking chair or a seat pad, bring them along. Whatever you need to make your trip feel fun and comfortable. Whatever that is, don't let anybody else make fun of you for it. I mean, what the heck? I brought a tiny stuffed horse. No joke. My very first backpacking trip, I brought a tiny horse plushie. I did. I have a photo of it sitting on a log next to the campfire with my dad and Black Beauty. I swear. True story. True story. It's time to talk about backpacks. Yeah. Welcome to the next lesson, friends. This one is all about backpacks. One thing you will obviously need if you are going backpacking, which is probably a given. But I'm not talking about the kind of backpack your 12 year old niece carries to school every day, obviously. Backpacks designed for use in the wilderness are a bit more involved. Of course, if your niece's backpack is big enough and has plenty of exterior attachment points, I'm not gonna tell you you can't use it as a backpacking pack especially if you're trying to save some money, but you will probably want to upgrade to something intended for the purpose at some point very soon. So let's talk about packs. Arguably the most fun piece of gear to pick out for backpacking. There are more or less three different types, external frame packs, internal frame packs, and ultra light packs. Let's break down the differences. An external frame pack is pretty much what it sounds like. The structural frame of the pack is on the outside of the fabric of the bag. Now, not many of these exist anymore, so you probably won't see them around too much. And for good reason, they're uncomfortable. Old school backpackers used to love them because they offered impressive capacity, unencumbered by curved or bulky frames on the inside of the pack that took up precious packing space. I mean, you could carry tons of stuff in an external frame pack and lash even more to the outside, but again, they were uncomfortable. So most people these days opt for an internal frame pack. In fact, that's what most backpacking brands make these days. You might see a few external frames here and there, but an internal frame backpacks are infinitely more common. So an internal frame pack has the structural frame on the inside, obviously. It's usually little more than a few aluminum bars to give the pack some structure and shape. They tend to be designed to conform to your back and be extremely comfortable, often with options for adjustability to really dial in the appropriate fit for you. They come in many sizes, from 40 liters to 80 liters and beyond, liters being the amount of space inside the pack. The larger the pack, the more it typically weighs. An internal frame pack is usually in the four to six pound range. But an internal frame pack is what most backpackers opt to use because they are functional, adjustable, and comfortable, and can still fit all of your gear. Big brands include Gregory, Deuter, Osprey, Big Agnes, and more. As for ultra light packs, these can come in all shapes and sizes, and as the name suggests, are super light, often between one to two pounds. Some of them, like the Osprey Levity, still have an internal frame to give the pack structure, while others, like the Gossamer Gear Gorilla, have no frame at all in order to reduce the weight of the pack even further. What type of ultralight pack you choose depends entirely on your preferences. A pack with a frame does tend to be more comfortable when carrying heavier loads or even moderately heavy loads, but a frameless pack can really go a long way towards cutting weight, which is what ultralight backpackers are looking for. I have tried both framed and frameless ultralight packs and like both, but I am an ultralight packer, so I'm usually not even carrying a moderately heavy load. See, the thing about about ultralight packs is that you need to pack ultralight in order for it to be comfortable. They are not designed to carry 50 pounds of gear. Also, the way that you pack an ultralight pack is exceedingly important for comfort and balance. So I would not recommend jumping straight into backpacking with a frameless ultralight pack. Instead, I'd suggest starting with a traditional internal frame pack and then graduate to an ultralight version once you've really streamlined your packing style and lightened your load. But let's talk about size and fit, because both are extremely important when selecting a pack for your outdoor adventures. Pick the wrong size or shape of a pack and you are almost guaranteed to struggle your entire trip. Trust me, 
been there. It can be annoying at best and uncomfortable at worst, neither of which make for an enjoyable outdoor experience. So my recommendation, especially if this is your first backpack purchase, is to go to a nearby outfitter or outdoor retailer and have them fit you for a pack. They'll help measure your torso and ensure that you are selecting a pack that's the right fit for your body type and size. Most packs have a fair amount of adjustability, unless they are ultralight packs, but still, packs are not usually one size fits all, especially if you're extra large or extra small. That said, if you don't have access to an outdoor retailer or say you found a really good deal on a nice pack online, holla, here's how to find out if the pack fits you correctly. Start by loosening all the straps and putting the pack on both shoulders. Clip the hip belt, ensuring that it fits snugly and that your hip bones sit right in the middle of the padding on the hip belt. Ensure that the pack sits comfortably against your back and there's no gap between your shoulders and the shoulder straps. To make sure that's the case, put some weight in the pack while you try it on. You're not going to be carrying it empty in the backcountry, so you shouldn't be trying it on empty. Find all the adjustment points on the back. Raise and lower the shoulder straps or hip belt if possible. Tighten and loosen everything and fiddle with adjustments until you dial in the right fit. If after a lot of trial and error, the pack doesn't rest comfortably against your back and shoulders, you may have the wrong size and you should try another one. Different brands of packs also fit differently, so try on a bunch to see which ones feel right on your torso. Bodies are different and packs will fit differently. And don't be afraid to try on a pack that's marketed to a different gender. Some packs are labeled men's and some are labeled women's, but that's often more for marketing than anything else. I've used several men's packs and they worked just fine. If you're a man with narrow shoulders, try a women's pack. If you're a woman with a long torso, try a men's. If you're a human who has any combination of any body shape or size, try them all. And don't feel weird about it. When you do load your pack up with gear, don't carry all the weight on your shoulders. Distribute it evenly between your shoulders and your hips. That's what the hip belt is for, after all. That will take some of the pressure and strain off your upper back and make just for easier carrying. Just make sure to keep straps, including the chest strap, snug. Loose straps mean wobbly packs and a wobbly pack that's shifting even a few centimeters can totally throw off your balance. And that can mean boots in creeks. As for what backpack capacity you should get, that depends on your gear, packing style, the length of your trip, and you, honestly. I'm a small person, so any pack over 50 liters is almost always gonna be too big for me. In fact, I can usually get away with a 40 liter pack for most trips. If you're a normal sized human, however, you can probably carry a 50, 60, even 70 liter pack. Anything bigger than that is likely overkill. There's a saying among backpackers, uh, also homeowners, if you have the space, you're gonna fill it. And that means more weight, but hey, hike your own hike. Meaning if you don't mind carrying 50 pounds on your back, if you like to have those creature comforts when you head out into the wilderness and that's more important to you than shaving ounces or pounds, then you do you. But for most people, a lighter pack means a more comfortable backpacking experience, less pressure and pain on the knees and shoulders. So my recommendation is to go with the smallest one you think will fit all of your gear and supplies and you probably need less than you think. That will usually include packs in the 40 to 60 liter range, for weekend to week long trips anyway. When you are picking out a pack, while size and fit are the most important aspects to consider, you'll also want to take a look at more superficial features, such as external pockets. Whether there's a removable lid, or the pack has extra pockets on the hip belt or shoulder straps and how easy it is to get into the pack to dig out all of your gear. My advice here is to simply play with a few packs at a store near you. It's super fun. Take a look at a bunch of features and make a wild guess as to which ones you'll find most useful. I love a good external stuff pocket on the front of my pack and hip belt pockets so I can easily store accessible snacks and items like sunscreen and lip balm. I also really appreciate water bottle pockets that allow you to slide in water bottles on the go 
and zippered pockets on the lid of my pack for snacks and such. But Josh puts a premium on whether a pack has a zipper around the front, which offers quick and easy access to all of his gear at once instead of having to dig in through the top and pull everything out. Everybody's packing style is different, so go with whatever seems right to you. Finally, let's talk about packing your backpack. Because not only is the shape and size of your pack important, but so is how you pack it. Shove stuff in there willy-nilly and you could end up wobbling all over the trail under a very uneven load. Or get to camp with one very sore shoulder. So when you pack, try to balance the weight from top to bottom and side to side so that all of your heavy gear isn't on one side of the pack or all at the top. Place softer, lighter items like sleeping bags and clothing at the very bottom of your pack. Put heavier items like cook sets, food, and your tent in the middle, closest to your back. And then keep the lightest items like snacks, accessories, and quick grab gear like a rain jacket at the very top of your pack. Put too much heavy stuff in the top and you'll feel off balance. Put it all at the bottom and it may feel like you're being dragged down. As for balancing weight from side to side, Try to distribute the weight evenly on the left and the right. That'll help keep you from tipping and swaying from side to side as you go down the trail. Add it all together and you have an excellent, comfortable backpacking experience. So start browsing! Pick out your favorite pack in your favorite color in the right size for you and start testing. You'll be ready to hit the trail in no time. So get out there in a correctly fitted pack, naturally, and wander on. I've carried external frame packs, I've carried internal frame packs, I've carried ultralight packs, I've carried all of the things. I'm an ultralighter. Look at me. Do I look like I could carry a heavy load? I am a tiny, tiny human. Child size even. Like, give me a child size pack, for crying out loud. I weigh not enough. I'll just say that. I weigh not enough. I don't really have a choice but to pack ultralight. So that's what I do. Yeah, it doesn't mean you have to pack ultralight. My dad's the backpacker with the 50 pound pack. I'm just saying. Ultralighter, 50 pound. Ultralighter, 50 pound. I don't know. I don't know. Bye. We've talked about backpacks, which, you know, are sort of required for backpacking. So let's move on to chatting about tents and other shelters. Because you gotta have somewhere to sleep, am I right? Well, that's not entirely true. Cowboy camping, where you just unroll your sleeping bag right on the ground out in the open, is always an option. But that's not for everyone. In fact, I'd say that most campers and backpackers prefer the relative security of a tent or some sort of shelter over just sleeping out in the open. So there are essentially three different types of shelters for backpacking. Your typical three-season tent that's good for use in spring, summer, and fall, a four-season tent that's more robust for winter camping and high alpine adventures, and a hammock. Bivvies, which are more or less a one-person crawl-in nylon coffin, are an option too, but generally those aren't as popular, so we'll skip them for now. You could also make an argument for more DIY shelters that involve draping a tarp over a ridge line hung between two trees or propped up by trekking poles, but tents are by far the most common and popular shelter among backpackers. So that's what we're gonna start with. What kind of tent you get will depend on where you're backpacking and whether or not you prefer an ultralight style of backpacking. The key is to look for one that suits the temperature and weather that you will be backpacking in and that fits the number of people you will be backpacking with. But before we get into specifics, let's talk generics. Tents usually come in two parts, the tent body and the fly. The body is the actual tent that you sleep in. The fly goes over the top of the tent body to protect you from the elements. Now, a fly is absolutely not necessary, strictly speaking, if you are camping in nice weather. When I go backpacking in the summer and there's no rain or snow or dust storms or what have you in the forecast, I very often leave my tent fly at home, sometimes by accident. That offers a few ounces in weight savings in my pack, but sleeping in a tent without a fly also facilitates airflow when it's really warm outside and offers very pleasant views. There are tents that don't have removable flies at all, of course, including some ultralight A-frame tents and most four-season tents meant for winter camping. These are called single-wall tents. 
Single wall tents are usually very quick and easy to set up, but can sometimes lack conveniences like vestibules or a ton of breathability. It really just depends on the tent. So a fly goes over the tent, but a footprint goes under it. However, unlike a fly, a footprint or a ground cloth doesn't usually come with most backpacking tents. You have to buy it separately. That's because it's not always, <sighs> strictly speaking, necessary. And some backpackers prefer to hike without one. But in our experience, they are a handy item to have. Essentially, a footprint is a durable piece of material that's very likely available in the exact size and shape as your tent from the same manufacturer as your tent and goes underneath the floor of your tent. What it does is protect the delicate fabric of your tent floor from coming into contact with the ground, which can scrape, scratch, or puncture the floor, which of course shortens your tent's lifespan. So if you're pitching your tent on gravel, rocks, on top of sticks, or grass covered in burrs, or any sort of sharp, uneven surfaces, we highly recommend a footprint to help prolong your tent's life. I mean, after all, I mean, a ground cloth is a lot cheaper to replace than a whole tent, so there's that. Manufacturers of good backpacking tents almost always offer dedicated footprints that you can buy for your specific tent. That's handy because a footprint should be the exact same size, maybe even a little bit smaller than your tent, so it doesn't collect water when it rains, to, which would then pool underneath your tent. But you can also use something as simple as a tarp from the hardware store. Some ultralight backpackers, myself included, prefer a sheet of Tyvek or similar house wrap product that's been cut to size. But let's talk about ultralight tents a minute. I'm an ultralight backpacker. I've mentioned it before. And that means the less a tent weighs, the better for me. But ultralight tents have their pros and cons, for sure. Many ultralight tents are perfect for warmer temperatures, but aren't the best suited for cold weather. They tend to be made of very thin fabrics and a lot of mesh, which means if you're taking them out in cold temperatures, you're gonna be pretty dang chilly all night long. They're also not as durable, meaning you're probably going to need to baby them a bit more, and you're definitely gonna wanna use a footprint. It's also not a bad idea to keep a few patches on hand in case your tent gets punctured on trail. Ultralight tents also tend to be more expensive. That said, the weight savings can be huge. An average two-person tent might weigh four or five pounds, while some ultralight versions hover closer to one or two. That's a really big deal if your goal is to reduce as much weight as possible in your pack. But now that we've talked about a few popular types of tents, Let's discuss size. If you're looking to purchase your first backpacking tent, you may be trying to figure out how big it should be. The answer to that depends on you and your style. For example, generally, if there are two people backpacking, common sense may dictate that you need a two-person tent. But that's not always the case. Many backpackers actually recommend getting a tent that has room for one more person than you will be backpacking with. That way, you have more space to spread out and store your gear inside the tent. For example, if there are two of you, get a three-person tent. Going solo, a two-person tent will feel <laughs> super luxurious. Indeed, it is quite nice to have all that extra space. Every time I've taken a two-person tent out when I'm on my own, I love it. But it does weigh more, so it's a trade-off. Just ask yourself whether you'd rather carry a little more weight for a little more elbow room, or whether you're fine storing your gear outside in the vestibule area or down by your feet in order to save a few ounces. Honestly, Josh and I have shared a very snug two-person ultralight tent for years with little to no issue, but we're small people, so there's plenty of room by our feet to stash empty packs and things. If you're tall or broad, you'll likely be much more comfortable in a larger tent. Now, maybe you're not a tent person. There are lots of backpackers out there who swear that hammocks are the way to go. Just a supreme way to spend the night outdoors. I myself love hammock camping. I find it extremely comfortable, especially in warm weather when air can move above and below you, keeping you cooler than if you were in a tent. But if you are hammock camping, there are a few things you'll need. You can get away with just a hammock, of course, but a few additional accessories can help make your experience a lot more comfortable. Accessories like a bug net and a rain fly. The first will help keep the creepy crawlies out and keep you from getting bitten by so many mosquitoes, and the latter can either keep you in shade on hot sunny days or 
keep the rain off if the skies open up and just pour water in the middle of the night. Some brands, like one of our favorites, Kamek, even sell all of it in one handy package. So if you're new to hammock camping, that might be the way to go. One tip before you plan to go hammock camping though, make sure there will be trees from which to hang said hammock and that you are allowed to hang it in the area you're planning on backpacking. Some parks don't allow hammocks at all and others won't have trees big enough to support them. But we'll talk more about finding the right campsites for tents and hammocks in a later lesson. Now, when it comes time to pick out a tent, especially if it's your first one, keep in mind that quality is very often directly related to price. So yes, you could save a few bucks by buying a less expensive tent from Amazon or Walmart from a brand you've never heard of, but chances are you're going to have to buy that exact same tent again next season. Cheap tents are cheap tents. They're just not as robust and will very likely tear years before their more expensive counterparts, and that's not sustainable. That said, if this is your first tent, don't feel the need to go crazy and get the most expensive, most ultralight tent on the market. Start with what you can afford, and if it suits your needs, great. If not, you can upgrade to a higher quality model in the future. But we'll talk about what to do with your old gear when you've outgrown it, in a later lesson. Another tip, if this is your first tent, practice pitching it in your yard before you take it backpacking. Listen, the last thing you want is to get your tent out into the wilderness and not be able to figure out which poles go where or how to put the dang thing together, especially if the sun is setting or you're hungry or tired and you don't have cell service and can't look up directions online. So practice pitching it a few times before your first trip to make sure you're comfortable with how it all goes together so you don't get frustrated and, I don't know, start yelling at your campmates in the backcountry. But that's tense, all. We'll list a few of our favorites, complete with links where they can be purchased in the notes below. And as always, if you have any more questions before moving on to the next lesson, drop us a line. An endless debate of tents versus hammocks. Who comes out on top? I don't know. It just depends. I love a good hammock. I really do. But I, I'm not trash tents either. I like them both. They have their places. All of the things. Even a bivy, I guess, from time to time. Though I've never personally used one, because, like I said, nylon coffin. I'd rather just sleep under a tarp. Yeah, 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 yeah bugs, whatever. But eh, you'll be fine. Probably. So protect yourself from the elements and wander on. Sleeping pads and sleeping bags and pillows, oh my! Now that we've discussed tents and shelters, let's talk about actually sleeping in the backcountry. Because wherever the destination, you're gonna want a comfortable, cozy place to lay your head outdoors. So, you know, you can get a good night's sleep. Now, first things first. Sleep system is just a fancy outdoorsy way of describing all the things you need to snooze comfortably, which includes your sleeping pad, your sleeping bag, and your pillow. Altogether, they make up your whole sleep system. So let's start from the bottom up, shall we? With your sleeping pad. There are several different types to choose from, namely a closed cell foam pad and an inflatable pad. Most backpackers prefer an inflatable sleeping pad, as these tend to be much more comfortable. It's exactly what it sounds like, a packable, portable, lightweight, air mattress, basically. They come in several varieties, including self-inflating and manual inflating. Self-inflating backpacking pads tend to be thinner when inflated, but also heavier, and they don't roll up as small due to a layer of foam in the center of the pad. But some people prefer them because they don't have to huff and puff into a sleeping pad as soon as they get to camp. You just unroll it and it inflates itself. That said, there are now ways around that that make manually inflated sleeping pads almost as convenient. Manually inflated sleeping pads will be thicker when inflated, sometimes as thick as four inches or more, but do require blowing up. But many inflatable sleeping pads these days come with pump sacks that make the inflation process quicker and easier and mean that you won't be out of breath after blowing up your mattress. I will occasionally bring a pump sack with me, but honestly, I'd often rather just blow mine up using the sheer power of my lungs and save the few ounces that a pump sack weighs. But that's because I'm an ultralight backpacker. Not sure if I mentioned it. There are also a handful of tiny handheld battery powered air pumps available from various retailers if you want to go that route, though they add even more weight and bulk to your pack. 
there are a few possible cons to using inflatable sleeping pads, of course, which you should be prepared for if you plan on using one. Namely, air mattresses can get punctured or spring a leak. They're filled with air. And if they do so in the backcountry, you'll be sleeping on the ground, which obviously isn't ideal. Fortunately, most inflatable sleeping pads from reputable brands come with patch kits. These might include extra pad material and glue or a stick-on patch. Either one is going to come in handy if your pad deflates on the trail, so I recommend always carrying a patch kit just in case. You should also consider buying a pad from a company that offers a lifetime guarantee, which is part of the reason why we are fans of Climate, who sponsored this lesson, by the way. In fact, we've been proud owners of several of their inflatable sleeping pads over the years, from ultra light to ultra comfy to insulated and more. The one time our Climate Static V2 sprung a leak, we shipped it off to the brand and they patched it up and sent it right back to us for free, no questions asked. Bonus, they have more gear than just sleeping pads, including pillows, inflatable lanterns, chairs, and more. You can find it all at climate.com. We'll put a link in the lesson text. Moving on, another popular kind of sleeping pad is a closed cell foam sleeping pad. This type of pad doesn't inflate, but rather unrolls or unfolds and you lay down right on top of it. Think dense egg crate type consistency. These pads are usually not as comfy, but are super lightweight and won't puncture. So if you step on one with your boot, lay it on a sharp rock, or accidentally stab it with your pocket knife, you don't have to worry about it deflating and having to sleep on the hard ground like you would if you accidentally stabbed a hole in your inflatable pad. So a closed cell foam pad offers a bit more peace of mind, especially for journeys longer than a couple of nights. But again, it's not as comfortable as inflatable sleeping pads. So there's a bit of a trade-off. Why would you choose one then? Well, many hardcore ultralight backpackers and through hikers who plan to be on the trail for weeks or months, not days, prefer them for their ease of use, durability, and versatility. But which type of pad you use? Well, that's totally up to you. I almost always opt for an inflatable sleeping pad, even on week-long journeys, because it's more comfortable, and it just offers a better night's sleep for me. Although I will say I have taken to bringing both types of pads with me for some adventures, and I'll tell you why. Mostly for warmth. If it's going to be cold outside, you likely want to layer a closed cell foam pad with an inflatable sleeping pad. The closed cell foam pad will offer more insulation and keep cold from the ground from seeping up into your inflatable sleeping pad and then into your body. If it's going to be super cold, say under 40 degrees Fahrenheit, you will probably want a closed cell foam pad and an insulated inflatable sleeping pad. Insulated inflatable sleeping pads have a higher R value, ratings that work just like the home insulation that you find at the hardware store. The higher the number, the more insulating they are and the better suited for colder temperatures. These usually have some sort of thermal lining or insulation inside to keep the air inside the pad from getting too cold, because that cold air will make you cold. It's called conductive heat loss, and it can start at temperatures as high as 68 degrees Fahrenheit or 20 degrees Celsius, though you probably don't need a dual layer pad system or an insulated pad until about 50 Fahrenheit or 10 Celsius. If you're trying to figure out what R value pad you'll need, depending on the temperature outside, we'll put a handy chart in the text below. So sleeping pad wrap up. You may want to close cell phone pad for ultralight adventures and if you're the type of person who can sleep on any surface, and an inflatable sleeping pad if you prefer more comfort, even if it costs a few extra ounces. And you should bring both if you're expecting temperatures to drop below about 50 degrees Fahrenheit. So let's move on to sleeping bags. Many seasoned outdoorists have an arsenal of sleeping bags. I'm talking at least two or three. But if you're just starting out, you really don't need that many. Start with one, and you can always add more to your gear closet if you deem it necessary. Of course, what bag that is will depend on what season in which you're planning on backpacking, but we'll get into that in a minute. If most of your backpacking and camping is in fair weather, say between 50 degrees Fahrenheit and 90 degrees Fahrenheit, I'd recommend sticking with a 30 or 45 degree sleeping bag. That way you can still be comfortable in slightly colder temperatures, but if it's warmer, you can ditch the bag and just use a sheet or thin blanket instead. Or my favorite, a sleeping bag liner. Just like with sleeping pads, there are several different types of sleeping bags. 
the largest difference involves the type of insulation, down or synthetic. Now, we're vegans here at TerraDrift, so we always choose and recommend for others synthetic insulation over down. Yes, down is lighter and compresses better, but there are more reasons to ditch down than just not wanting to exploit animals. So if that's not important to you, this might be. If down gets wet, say if it rains or you slip and fall while crossing a creek or there's snow on the ground, your sleeping bag or down jacket will no longer keep you warm when it's wet. Because when down gets wet, it's useless. And that can be dangerous when you are in the backcountry far from civilization. Synthetic insulation, on the other hand, retains almost all of its insulating powers when it's wet. So if you get caught in an unexpected rain shower or fall in that same creek or even spill your water bottle all over your sleeping bag, you'll still be able to stay warm when it comes time to tuck in for the night. Just ask Josh. He slipped and submerged about half of his backpack in a stream while backpacking in Alaska, and even though a good third of his bag got soaked, he was still able to sleep warm that night because it was a synthetically insulated bag. Down bags also require special care, including needing dedicated detergents when it comes time to wash your bag, and yes, you should definitely wash your bag, but more on that later. Plus, down is significantly more expensive, so if you're on a budget, synthetic is the way to go. Sleeping bags, even more than sleeping pads, are also rated for different temperatures. For example, you can get a 50 degree bag or a zero degree bag, or any temperature in between. But the most popular temperature ratings are probably between 15 and 45 degrees Fahrenheit. That said, temperature ratings are not as straightforward as you might think. A 30 degree bag, for example, is very likely only going to be comfortable down to 40 or 45 degrees. Often, the temperature rating advertised in bold print on the label or on the bag itself is the limit rating. That means that's the absolute lowest temperature limit the bag can handle, as in you probably won't freeze, but you're not gonna be warm either. If you wanna be comfortable, you would need something with a lower temperature rating than the forecasted overnight lows. For example, if it's going to be 30 degrees Fahrenheit overnight, you would likely need at least a 20 degree sleeping bag in order to be comfortable. Most sleeping bags will have both temperature ratings, comfort and limit, printed on the bag so you can easily check and see which are most suitable for your endeavors. However, these ratings also differ between men's and women's bags. There are unisex bags, of course, but those temperature ratings will likely be for a body that runs a little warmer, aka a man's. Women's bags are specified as such, mostly because women's bodies tend to run colder, so women's bags will very likely be a little heavier and larger than their men's bag counterparts, because it has more insulation. Sometimes they're shaped a little differently too, say with a bit more room around the hips, but that's about it. The bottom line here, keep your body temperature in mind when selecting a sleeping bag. I know that I tend to sleep very cold, so I should get a bag rated for much colder temperatures than I think I need, whereas someone who sleeps warmer may do fine with a bag rated for the exact right temperature. Just make sure to check the bag to see what the displayed rating actually stands for and purchase a bag based on the comfort rating if one is listed instead of the limit rating. Now, say you go out and buy a sleeping bag and it works great for your first few trips. Awesome, but maybe you're planning a trip and you look at the temperature for the overnight lows and your bag isn't gonna quite cut it. The good news is you don't have to go out and buy a whole new sleeping bag. <laughs> Huzzah, am I right? You can, of course, if you want to, but there are ways to stretch your sleeping bag temperature rating. One is to get a sleeping bag liner. This is often a thin fabric or fleece bag that will fit nicely inside a typical sleeping bag offering an extra layer of warmth, like adding an extra blanket to your bed at night when it gets a little chilly. This will bump up the temperature rating a smidge, something that sometimes between 10 to 20 degrees. There are also battery powered heated sleeping bag liners like those from Ignic. Just plug in, power on, and stay nice and toasty. If you are staying out for more than one night though, you will likely need a backup battery or power brick to power said liner. But it's a great option if you really want to keep your sleeping bag nice and warm on cold nights. You can also layer sleeping bags. This works well if you already have two sleeping bags but neither are suitable for the overnight lows you're expecting. Say it's going to be 15 degrees one night. 
but all you have is a 30 degree bag and a 45 degree bag. No problem, bring both. Line the 30 degree bag with the 45 degree bag and you automatically have an extra warm sleep setup. This works especially well if you don't camp in truly cold temperatures very often and don't want to buy an expensive zero degree bag for one night a year. So sleeping bags sorted, let's move on to pillows. This one is more of a preferential thing. Essentially, you should just find a pillow that works well for you. There are plenty of different types available, including inflatable pillows, foam pillows, even DIY pillows that involve filling a stuff sack with extra clothing and shoving it under your head at night. That last one may be for the true ultra lighters among us, but most folks prefer either a foam pillow that you can kind of smash up and shove into your bag or an inflatable that takes up almost no room, but sometimes isn't quite as cushy and comfy. Either one offers a pretty comfortable place to lay your head at night. I just recommend testing out a few, seeing which kind you like best and sticking with that one. Simple, right? If you need some help deciding, we'll link to a video we did comparing a bunch of different types of backpacking pillows in the text below. And that, my friends, pretty much wraps it up for your sleep system. We hope that helps clarify some things so you can sleep comfortably in the outdoors on your first or next camping trip. I love a good sleeping bag, personally. I like a nice, supple nylon fabric, real soft, you know, so you can just cozy it up. A mummy bag to cinch that so you can get the little, little eyeballs. This is a mummy bag, just FYI. A cinched up mummy bag, in case you were wondering what I'm doing. So we've covered a lot of the main gear you need to take with you into the backcountry, but let's talk about the clothing you need to put on your back, including layering and dressing for the outdoors, which full disclosure can look a lot different depending on who you are, where you're hiking and what the weather is doing. But let's dive in, shall we? For starters, clothing for backpacking may or may not look very different from the clothing you might wear on a day hike. When you're just going out for a day hike in a warm climate, it's not always necessary to break out all of your highly technical synthetics. Maybe you want to, I don't know. But often on summer hikes, a lightweight pair of shorts and a cotton t-shirt or tank top will do just fine, especially if you're hiking in a dry climate. Backpacking, on the other hand, requires more thoughtful outfitting, especially if foul weather is going to be a factor. For starters, unlike with the day hike, you can't just head back to the car and drive yourself home to warm up or change your clothes if you get wet or cold. When you're backpacking, you have to bring with you everything you need to survive, including clothing. So especially if you're in cool, cold, and wet climates, you need to be extra cautious and ensure that if and when you get wet or sweat through your clothing, it isn't going to cause hypothermia. And that starts by ditching cotton in exchange for synthetics. In fact, there's a saying among backpackers, cotton kills. Meaning that natural fabrics are typically heavy when wet, dry extremely slowly, and if temps drop below even 50 degrees Fahrenheit or 10 Celsius, clothing that's even damp from sweat can quickly lead to hypothermia because your body loses up to 25 times more heat when it's wet than when it's dry. But more on that in a minute. So if cotton and other natural fibers like hemp are off the table, what should you wear? Synthetics. Pretty much everything I wear backpacking is synthetic. Here at Terra Drift, we don't wear wool or leather for the same reasons we don't use down, because we're vegan. But whether or not that's of concern to you, synthetics are the best choice for staying cool and dry in the summer and warm and dry in the winter. They help sweat evaporate from your body, they dry fast, and they insulate really well. When I backpack, I am often wearing synthetic shorts or pants, depending on the temperature, and a synthetic shirt. Now, I do know backpackers who choose to wear cotton shirts when backpacking in the summer, but if I'm being totally honest, it looks very uncomfortable. They are often drenched with sweat, have to carry extra soggy, heavy clothing when it doesn't dry overnight, and end up packing way more clothing than they need to because they have to change their shirt once or twice a day and have a fresh one every single day. Cotton also tends to chafe more when it's wet, which can become very uncomfortable very quickly. 
For that reason, cotton is a pass for me. But in warm climates, especially in areas with super low humidity, you might be able to get away with it. That's because summer hikes don't require as much careful planning clothing-wise, and you don't usually need to bring as many changes of clothes if the temps stay above 70 degrees Fahrenheit or so. For example, on a recent warm seven-day backpacking trip, I brought one synthetic long sleeve sun shirt, one synthetic t-shirt, and an insulated hoodie for cool evenings and mornings, plus one pair of shorts and one pair of pants. That was it. On hot backpacking trips like we often take in the southwest where we live, I usually only bring two synthetic shirts and one pair of shorts. Often I won't even bring a separate outfit to sleep in, though many people do bring dedicated sleepwear and that's totally up to you. If it's going to be cold, like below 50 degrees Fahrenheit on the other hand, clothing selection and layering requires extra care. You should consider bringing a synthetic base layer, a synthetic mid layer, and or a jacket depending on how cold it's going to get. A synthetic base layer probably includes a pair of leggings and a long sleeve shirt, both of which should be snug, but not so tight they restrict circulation. You still want to be able to feel your legs while you're hiking. On top of your base layer, wear a pair of durable nylon or polyester pants. Bonus if they are water resistant, especially if you're expecting rain, mist, or snow. On your top half, place a mid layer of some sort on top of your base layer. This could be a fleece pullover, a lightly insulated hoodie, or a stretchy thermal zip up. If it's extra cold, add a synthetically insulated lightweight puffy jacket on top and then add a waterproof shell. That should keep you toasty in very cold temperatures, but also allows you to shed layers as you move to keep from getting too hot and sweaty. Very cold is relative, of course. The ability to shed layers is important because when hiking in the cold, sweat is the enemy. So it's vital that you remove layers as you warm up and then immediately put them back on when you stop to rest so you don't get cold. Regulating your body temperature takes practice and lots more stopping and adjusting than hiking in warmer climates, but you'll figure it out. Why is it so important to be proactive about adjusting layers as you move? Because while it's fairly easy to make little adjustments to maintain your body temperature, like taking off a jacket or putting it back on again, it's much more difficult and takes a lot more energy, energy you'd probably rather not spend on this to get warm again once you start to shiver. So stay on top of moderating layers and don't let yourself get to the point where you're either sweating profusely, again, hypothermia or shivering before you add or remove clothing. As for other layers, don't forget your hands and your feet when you're layering. In warm temperatures, a simple pair of synthetic socks are probably adequate, unless you're prone to blisters, in which case you might prefer a double layer system, consisting of a thin liner sock next to your skin and a thicker sock on top of that. Use the same winter layering system for your feet. Put a nice thick warm sock on top of your synthetic sock for ultimate insulating power. Keep your tootsies all nice and warm. The same technique goes for your hands. If it's cold enough that gloves are required, wear a thin liner glove under a nice thick insulated winter glove or mitten. That way your digits stay warmer, but if you have to remove a bulky glove or a mitten to fasten buckles or zippers or cook dinner, your hands will still be at least a little protected from the elements. <laughs> See? Handy, right? As for what other clothing to pack, for safety purposes, always bring an extra layer like a rain jacket or a fleece, even if you're not necessarily expecting cold or rain. Sometimes overnight lows, higher elevations, or even deep shade can make it feel a lot colder than it actually is. And surprise rain showers and damp fog can roll in at any time, so it's important to be prepared. You should also always bring a spare pair of socks, especially if it's cold outside, but for summer trips too and then protect those socks with your life. By which I mean keep them dry at all costs. I like to keep a pair stuffed in the bottom of my sleeping bag that I only put on at night. That way they don't get sweaty in my hiking boots or damp when crossing streams or hiking through wet grass. They're always there, they're always dry. In fact, when backpacking in cool or cold temperatures, it's important to keep an entire layer, such as an additional base layer, completely free from dampness and moisture. That way you always have a completely dry layer to sleep in at night or that you can change into if there's an emergency. And speaking of wet weather, if you will be backpacking in the rain, make sure you bring along a good rain jacket or shell. 
There are plenty of options available from ultralight packable jackets, perfect for short showers, to rugged outerwear for extended downpours, to heavy duty shells for extreme winter weather. Heck, you could even just use something as simple as a poncho, which, <laughs> BT dubs, I still often bring along. It protects me and my pack, but doesn't perform very well in the wind, just FYI. As for accessories, don't forget a hat. I like a wide-brimmed variety in warmer months and a ball cap any time of year, plus sunglasses to protect these peepers. A bandana or neck gaiter like a buff is also essential, not just for keeping the sun off your neck, but it can also double as a water filter, a tissue, sweat mop, or <laughs> my favorite, to dip into a cold stream and wrap around your head and neck to cool you off during a long hot hike. So bottom line, the clothing you choose is important. It will likely take practice to learn exactly what you need for any given temperature and condition, but always err on the side of bringing too much clothing. It could literally save your life. So layer up, you know, intelligently, and get out there and wander on. What kind of synthetics you get doesn't really matter. I mean, synthetics are synthetics are synthetics. That's not entirely true. There are varying qualities of synthetics that are just all over the spectrum, but hey, I mean, like, go to Goodwill, buy yourself some bike shorts, get yourself a Nike tank top, like, doesn't matter, it's synthetic, it's gonna do what synthetics do. You're gonna be good, don't worry about it. You, you only have to drop $59 on a sun shirt if you want to drop $59 on a sun shirt. That's all I'm saying here. Okay, that's all. I need some water. Who else needs a break? You need a break? You need a break? Take a break. Get some water. Stay hydrated, my friends. Let's talk about foot stuff. <laughs> We're gonna talk about feet. We've talked about clothing, now let's talk about footwear, which, as you may have guessed, is extremely important when backpacking. In fact, the footwear you choose can make or break your entire trip. There are several backpacking trips that stand out in my mind as wonderful experiences, but where I distinctly remember wanting to chop off my feet at the ankles after about two hours. You don't want that. So finding the right pair of shoes for you will be extremely important. Note the key words in that phrase being for you. Because guys, we all have different preferences and needs when it comes to hiking footwear. I, for example, prefer a zero drop hiking shoe with a wide toe box so that my toes really have a lot of freedom of movement. Josh prefers a mid-rise boot. You may prefer or even need a supportive arch or a tall boot to lock in your ankle or a little extra squish in the sole. Chances are you won't know until you've tried a bunch of options. I hiked and backpacked in a lot of uncomfortable boots before I found the ones I really love. They're ultra blown peaks, by the way. In any case, the key to finding your perfect pair will probably be to test out a lot of shoes and see what makes your feet the happiest. Borrow them from friends if you can. Buy a used pair or two just to see how they perform. Head to your local outdoor store and try on a dozen pairs or so just to see how they feel. If you do, make sure to wear the type of socks you'll be wearing when you backpack and try them on in the middle or at the end of the day when you've already been on your feet for several hours. When you purchase a new pair, only wear them around the house for a week or two to see if they're comfortable enough to hike in. And then take them out on day hikes to make sure that they're not only comfortable, but that they can handle rough terrain. And here's a pro tip. If you buy a pair of boots or shoes from REI, take them out and find them to be uncomfortable or just unsuitable, the retailer will let you return them within a year of purchase. Rad, right? Now, some boots do require a break in period. I don't buy leather boots or shoes, but if you do, those are the kinds that most frequently need broken in. So make sure to wear them for several weeks around the house, around town, and on day hikes to make sure they get softened up and aren't gonna give you blisters or be uncomfortably stiff once you hit the trail for real. Synthetic shoes, on the other hand, rarely need broken in. Most hiking shoes or boots that I've purchased have been comfortable and flexible right out of the box. Only once can I remember a pair of synthetic boots that needed to be broken in before they were really ready to go the distance. Next up, the big question, 
whether you should buy waterproof shoes or boots. <laughs> ah yes, the age-old debate, to which the answer depends on your preferences, but also where you'll be hiking and in what conditions. For summer hikes, I almost always opt for non-waterproof shoes. That's because waterproofing tends to reduce breathability and make boots hotter and your feet sweaty. I do not like sweaty feet, so I like non-waterproof shoes. That said, I do a lot of hiking and backpacking around Texas where it's hot and there aren't frequent water crossings. Plus, since my shoes are light and don't have that waterproof barrier, they dry out more quickly if they do get wet. If, on the other hand, you are hiking in the summer in a place with a lot of shallow stream crossings or a significant amount of mud, you may prefer to wear mid-rise waterproof boots so that you can quickly and easily splash through without worrying about your socks getting wet. On the other, other hand. How many hands do we have now? If you're hiking in wet, humid conditions like in New England and frequently experience high water crossings or a lot of heavy rain during your backpacking trips, waterproof shoes or boots aren't really gonna do you a lot of good. Because once water gets into waterproof shoes, it stays there. One option is to bring a pair of sandals with you. I always backpack with an ultralight pair of sandals that I change into when I get to camp, which I highly recommend for comfort and convenience, just by the way. But you can also change into those sandals at creek crossings. This will keep your boots dry, plus offer an opportunity to cool your toes. Cold weather backpacking, of course, is another story. If you're hiking in snow or there are shallow, frigid water crossings, you definitely want mid-rise to high-rise waterproof boots. Because frankly, keeping your feet dry and warm is of the utmost importance. But back to shoe selection. When you do pick out a new pair of boots, get at least a half size larger than your day-to-day -day shoes, sometimes even a whole size larger. This is so that when your feet swell after a long day of hiking, they have room to expand, but it also gives your toes room to slide forward on long stretches of downhill trail. If you neglect to size up, <laughs> your toes are very likely going to be taking a beating as they ram into the toes of your boots. As for tying said boots or shoes, we're gonna throw a bonus video below with tips and tricks for lacing and tying to really dial in the fit and comfort of your boots or shoes and also keep you from having to bend over and retie or relace every couple of miles. Long story short, finding the perfect pair of boots or shoes will likely involve a fair amount of trial and error. If you're lucky enough to find a comfortable pair the first time around, pfft, dang, just, I'm jealous. It took me years. But know that even if you're struggling to find the perfect fit, there are a wide variety of lacing techniques, insoles and inserts, plus just different styles of shoes, ranging from barefoot to ultra supportive to heck even sandals, all of which are appropriate for backpacking. Just make sure to take care of your feet when heading outdoors for an extended period of time. So when you're ready to find that perfect pair, good luck. Lace them up and wander on. Insert foot jokes here. I don't know any foot jokes. Feel free to share them. I love a good foot joke or a hand joke or a ear joke. I, does that exist? We all want the perfect campsite every time we pitch our tent. An amazing view, a nice shade tree, safe surroundings, a secluded spot so you can poop in the woods without worrying whether anyone is going to wander past. You know, normal stuff. But finding the perfect site and then pitching your tent safely is sometimes easier said than done. Fortunately, there are ways to locate just what you want or need no matter where you find yourself. So here's how to find the perfect spot that leaves no trace and set up a winning campsite when you're headed deep into the backcountry. When it comes to picking the ideal spot to pitch your tent or hang your hammock, Safety is key. So before you drop your bag in the first semi-clear spot of ground you see, look around to make sure you're not putting yourself in harm's way. But let's start with the types of campsites. There are two main ones when it comes to backpacking, designated and wilderness or undeveloped. Designated campsites often feature cleared areas that volunteers, conservation groups, or rangers have developed specifically for backpackers. These can sometimes just be a clearing, but occasionally they'll have a fire ring or a pit, maybe a post for hanging your pack, possibly even a picnic table. 
These sites are usually well marked on the map and on the trail. Undeveloped sites or true wilderness sites, on the other hand, are rarely marked on a map or trail and can vary wildly in appearance. Some sites you come across may resemble developed campsites in that they look like cleared areas purpose-built for camping. That's likely because lots of people have camped there, while others end up being wherever you manage to find a flat spot. We'll talk about both kinds and what to look for in each to keep you safe and leave no trace. When backcountry camping in wilderness areas where there may or may not be developed and designated campsites, to find the best places to call in a night, ask around at local gear shops or at ranger stations to discover where the best campsites are hidden. Because listen, locals always have the inside scoop. If there are designated sites and you're allowed to pick your own, don't drop your gear at the first one you pass. Check out several farther down the trail to see if one just has that magic about it. You know, the perfect shade tree, an epic view, logs arranged as seats around a fire pit, access to easy water. And if you have the rare opportunity to book a specific backcountry site online, like at some state parks, look at photos on the booking platform so you can take a peek at what kind of sites are available. This is especially handy when hammock camping and you need to know if there are enough large trees from which to hang your bed. Of course, views aren't everything. There's safety to consider too. So whether you're staying in a developed or undeveloped site, check for a few dangers and warning signs before you set up camp. For starters, look for widow makers. As in, don't pitch your tent directly under dead tree limbs or near dead trees that could topple. If the wind picks up or there's an unexpected storm in the middle of the night, the last thing you want is a branch or a whole tree falling on your tent. Second, hang your hammock from sturdy trees. If you're hammock camping, that is. Don't hang it on any trees smaller than 15 inches wide or that aren't alive and healthy. Any smaller and you could damage the tree. And if the tree is dead, it could topple over on you. I feel like we just talked about this. Look for flood hazards too. Rain can cause flooding whether water is falling from the sky directly overhead or way upstream somewhere. So no matter the forecast, don't pitch your tent in a low spot where water can collect or too close to a stream bed that could swell and rise if there's a storm. It's also handy to look for wind breaks. Take advantage of large boulders or hills that can function to block the wind so that a, you're not listening to your tent nylon snap all night long, and B, it'll help protect your tent from folding in half on extremely windy adventures. Just don't camp too close to cliffs or hills that might be prone to rock slides. And don't forget about animals. We're gonna say it again. Always properly store food for the region you're in and the wildlife found there. For example, Use a bear safe or a locker to store your food if bears or even wily rodents can be found nearby. Especially when looking for campsites in wilderness areas, keep a few pointers in mind. Pitch your tent out of sight of trails and at least 200 feet away from natural water sources. Some parks dictate more specific distances from trails, so check before you head out. If there are already tents pitched nearby, give them space. They probably came out here to enjoy the peace of nature just like you, so don't camp right next door. Be patient and start looking for campsites early if you're unfamiliar with the area. There's really little worse than waiting until dinner time to start scoping for a site and not finding one until two hours later when you're tired and hangry. A good wilderness site can occasionally be tricky to find. Once you've found a spot that looks solid from a safety perspective, the next most important thing is to set up a campsite that leaves no trace. We've already talked about this in some detail, but when it comes to campsites, there are a few extra things to consider. We've mentioned looking for areas that feature durable natural surfaces like packed dirt, sand, smooth rock, or hardy grasses, not areas with wildflowers, tall prairie grasses, or other delicate flora. And whatever you do, never camp on cryptobiotic soil. Then there's the beloved campfire. And first things first here, only build a fire if one, you're allowed where you're backpacking. Fire bans are increasingly common across the country. Two, you feel confident in your abilities to build and extinguish the fire safely. And three, there are sufficient fire building materials nearby that you can collect responsibly. Remember the leave no trace principle, dead and downed wood only, no bigger around than your wrist. If you meet all that criteria, have at it. 
but clear the ground of dry grass, leaves, etc. within about a three foot radius of the fire, have plenty of water on standby for extinguishing, and consider collecting wood from beyond the immediate vicinity of your campsite. Finally, don't forget to bring something in which to dispose of your garbage. A small trash bag or gallon zip top bag will do the trick nicely and help keep camp tidy. And of course there's the bathroom. Remember if there isn't a drop toilet nearby, pick a spot at least 100 feet away from your campsite if at all possible to designate as your bathroom area. Use your cat hole shovel or ultralight spade to dig a hole six to eight inches deep, go in the hole, and cover it all up thoroughly when you're finished. Like a cat does. Get it? And yes, while it's colloquially known as a poop shovel, no poop should actually ever touch the shovel. It's strictly for digging holes in the dirt and covering up those holes again. So enjoy the search for the perfect campsite, camp smart out there, and wander on. You know, some people name their poop shovels. Here's one, this one's my favorite. Uh, I met someone once who, who named theirs Doug. <laughs> That's good, right? It's a good one. I like that one. Um, uh, my good friend, hers is named Raul the Traul. <laughs> so clever, right? I wish I would have thought of it. I'm, I'm ashamed. I'm ashamed and embarrassed to say that my poop shovel does not have a name. I'm open to suggestions. Throw them out there and uh, we'll, we'll get that thing named. Let's talk about hydration and water purification in the outdoors. Cause not sure if it's occurred to you yet, but in most backcountry areas, uh, there are not gonna be faucets at which you could just fill up your water bottles and bladders. That means you're likely going to have to refill reservoirs from natural sources while you're out there. Sure, for short overnight trips, you can probably pack in all the water you need, but after about two nights, that's not a lot of fun. Water is heavy, and the hotter it is, the more you have to carry. So refilling when you're out there is often the better option. That said, and this is an important one, unless you are literally about to die from thirst or all of your purification options have failed you, do not drink water straight from natural water sources without filtering it and purifying it unless it is coming directly from an underground spring. Any other water, no matter how clean and clear it looks, can contain protozoa, bacteria, and viruses that can make you extremely sick. I'm talking serious stomach upset and diarrhea, giardia, salmonella, E. coli, and more. So once more for good measure, do not drink untreated water in the backcountry. So how do you treat water then? You should always filter and purify water from natural sources before drinking. There are a few ways to do this. The only two ways that are guaranteed to kill everything, including protozoa, viruses, and bacteria, are boiling your water or sanitizing it with a UV treatment like a UV pen. If you're planning to do either, you should still filter water through at least a bandana or coffee filter to remove debris and other sediment. If you plan to boil your water, bring it to a rolling boil and leave it there for one minute, just to be safe. As for a UV pen, how long it takes to sterilize water will depend on how much water you're trying to sterilize in one go. So read the directions carefully on the package of whatever you UV pen you've purchased and follow them to a T. But UV pens are expensive. They don't work in cloudy water and they require batteries. So many people opt for a simpler, less high-tech sterilization option. Boiling is an easy one if you brought a stove with you and plenty of fuel, but boiling may not be the most efficient way to sterilize water if you're on the move. Like, if you need to refill in the middle of the day and still have a lot of ground to cover. You probably don't want to set up your stove, sit down, and boil a few liters of water, then wait until it's cool enough to drink. So what are the other options? There are several. My favorite is to use a combination filter and purifier system. There aren't very many of these out there. Our favorite here at TerraDrift is the Grail filter bottle, which filters and purifies. However, it's fairly heavy, so if you are an ultralight backpacker, you may sneer at the extra ounces required. 
Other systems include the Rapid Pure Filter Bottle and Epic Water Filters. Both of these are solid options with their own sets of pros and cons. We'll link to a video below that breaks all three of them down so that you can decide if one of them is right for you. But I think by far the most popular way to filter and purify water is with a dual system, meaning a filter of some kind, like a life straw, which filters out bacteria and protozoa, but not viruses. And then once your water is filtered, you can use a purifier tablet or drops like aqua tabs or iodine sterilization tabs that purify the water by killing viruses, thus removing all the baddies from your water and making it safe to drink. Skip one of the two steps and you might be all right depending on where you filled up your bottle, but you're also taking the chance that there's still something in the water that could make you sick. So personally, I don't risk it. I always filter and purify. Sometimes when water is cloudy or silty, double filtering is necessary, by which I mean filter the water through that bandana or coffee filter that I mentioned before, before you fill a bottle with it, then run the water through a filter into a clean bottle and purify it. Here's an example. Start with a wide mouth bottle like a Nalgene or our favorite hydration multi-tool, a model, who sponsored this lesson by the way, which is great because model may just be the most versatile hydration tool out there. In addition to being a nice big water bottle that is easy to clean, attaches to just about anything, and can be used as a pillow in a pinch, you can also score all sorts of functional add-ons called mods to transform the vessel into a shower, a squeeze bottle, a sling, hydration reservoir, and maybe most notably a gravity filter or straw filter. It's literally a bottle that does it all and we're big fans. And good news, students can use the code Terra20 for 20% off their first order if you'd like to score one for yourself. So find the whole line at modeloutdoors.com and we're going to put a link in the lesson text below. But back to filtering. Place a bandana, neck gaiter, or coffee filter or any piece of clothing or fabric over the mouth of the bottle and make sure it is secured well by either holding it tightly with your hand or a rubber band. Then fill up your water bottle. The bandana will filter out solid particles like sticks, debris, sand, dead leaves, and dirt that could clog your water filter or make your UV pin less effective. We always filter our water in this manner, as in through a bandana, no matter how we will be purifying it later. After all, even if we are boiling the water, which kills everything no matter what, we still don't want to drink sediment or dead leaves. Yeah. Along those same lines, if you are planning on refilling water bottles or hydration packs on the trail from natural water sources, remember that one water bottle will always be contaminated. Take extra care to make sure that you don't drink out of that contaminated water bottle later in the trip. Many backpackers mark their dirty water bottles with a piece of tape or ribbon as a reminder that that bottle may contain dangerous bacteria. There are plenty of filter options available. You can go with a gravity filter if you are filtering a significant amount of water for just yourself or a whole group. There are squeeze filters available that let you connect a filter to a disposable water bottle or a squeezable water bottle that force the water through a filter into a clean vessel. You can also use something like a straw filter. Filters can go directly onto water bottles or be a completely separate accessory. All are valid filtering options. Just remember to always combine a filter with a water purification tablet or drops to protect you from the full spectrum of gross stuff that can be in the water. And if you do happen to come across a natural spring, pfft, consider yourself lucky. Celebrate, fill up all the water bottles because that's the only time that you don't need to filter and purify. If there's snow on the ground, you'll also need to filter and purify that after melting it. So drink smart out there. Filter and purify your water and don't get weird gross diseases in the backcountry. It's really unpleasant. Drink up and wander on. Welcome back. It's time to talk about everybody's favorite subject, eating. Just mine? It's obviously extremely important for, you know, day-to-day -day life, but may look a little different when you're backpacking. For starters, you're going to burn a lot more calories than you think when you're spending six or more hours a day hiking with a heavy load on your back, even if you're not tackling a lot of elevation gain. So what you eat on the trail and how much you eat is extremely important. In fact, we'll put a hiking calorie calculator in the lesson text to help you figure out how much you will need to eat based on your trip and your body type. But Assume you'll need something around 3,000 calories a day for starters. So let's start with what we like to eat on the trail. 
on any given trip, I'll bring vegan jerky, fruit leather, tortillas with peanut butter, uh, cliff bars or other plant-based protein bars, ginger chews, oatmeal, granola, instant rice, hummus mix, noodles, etc. For lunch, I like to stick with things that are quick and easy like peanut butter and jelly tortillas or sandwiches, rehydrated hummus, fruit leather or protein bars and snacks like vegan jerky or trail mix. Stuff that doesn't require cooking and I can easily grab and go when I find a good spot to sit and rest. Other great snacks and lunch items include olives, fresh fruit, remember that you'll have to pack out all those peels and cores, chocolate if it's not going to be too hot, energy cookies and high protein desserts like Larry and Lenny's plant-based protein cookies, and untapped maple energy waffles. I'll bring dried hummus and refried beans and chips, you name it. The lighter and more calorie dense it is, the better. For breakfast, I like to take a few minutes to make coffee, preferably with some packable vegan creamer, plus oatmeal with granola and dried fruit. It only takes a few minutes to make, and that means I can hit the trail early if I want to. For dinner, however, there's plenty of time to sit and cook a warm meal, which is nice, especially when it's chilly outside. Of course, if it's too hot to cook or you don't want to bring a stove with you, you can prepare a meal by cold soaking things like noodles or quinoa with dried veggies for a few hours before dinner time. That said, there's nothing quite like a warm cup of tea or cocoa and a hot bowl of ramen at the end of a long day of hiking. In either case, we often make our own backpacking meals out of some sort of dried noodles or instant grains like rice, ramen noodles, rice noodles, even quinoa or chickpea pasta, none of which take that long to cook. Then we add ingredients like vegan textured vegetable protein or TVP, freeze-dried vegetables and various seasonings to craft everything from peanut noodles to curry to vegan alfredo. We'll include a link to our favorite vegan backpacking recipes below, but you can also buy pre-made meals that are quick and easy and only require adding hot water such as instant dried soup, backpacking meals that you can buy at a local outdoor store, or straight up cup of noodles type stuff. Though if we're gonna buy a pre-made meal, we like to go with something really delicious and sustainable like a vegan meal from Food for the Soul. That brand makes some of our favorite backpacking meals and they even offer them in bulk compostable packaging to reduce waste. Rad, right? Whatever you choose, just make sure that what you're eating contains enough calories. I like to bring an extra squeeze bottle of cooking oil or nut butter to add a little fat to things, which is the fastest way to up the calorie content of a meal. But let's talk about the actual act of cooking, because if you are planning to enjoy a warm meal, you're gonna have to have a stove on which to prepare it. You can, of course, cook over a fire if fires are allowed in the region where you're backpacking, but that can often take a gruelingly long time, especially at the end of the day when you're hungry and tired. So most backpackers who want to enjoy a hot meal or beverage pack a stove. There are many backpacking stoves to choose from, including alcohol stoves, tablet stoves, canister stoves, and liquid fuel stoves. But canister stoves are by far the most popular and readily available. You've probably seen them if you've walked into any outdoor store. They're usually small, lightweight, foldable apparatuses that fit in the palm of your hand and attach to a canister of isopro fuel. In most temperatures and instances, Canister stoves, which include jet boil systems, are the most reliable and easy to use on the market, which is why they're so popular. Their only downsides? The canisters do tend to be a bit heavy if you like to pack ultra light. And in temperatures lower than about 20 degrees Fahrenheit, a canister stove won't burn efficiently, if it even lights at all. So if you're winter camping, that may not be the best option. But for everything else, it's kind of the standard. It boils water quickly and provides even consistent heat. I mean, there's a reason it's most backpackers first and only backpacking stove. That's what we often use when we're backpacking because boiling water and adding it to dried ingredients and letting those ingredients sit for 10 or 15 minutes is how we cook almost all of our meals in the backcountry. So for ease of use and efficiency, canister stoves can't be beat. Cooking this way, often referred to as freezer bag cooking, offers a way to prepare a meal that doesn't use as much fuel as if I were, say, boiling and simmering or sauteing dinner in a pan on a stovetop. Though I will say that we no longer recommend cooking directly in a zip-top freezer bag. 
Not only is it wasteful, they aren't designed to contain hot liquids. Instead, dump your ingredients into your pot after your water is done boiling, or pour it all into a reusable bowl with a lid to cook it all up. As for other types of stoves, we'll put a link to a bonus video comparing the main types in more detail below, but the alternatives include liquid fuel stoves, alcohol stoves, tablet stoves, and wood burning stoves. Some weigh less than others, some are designed for use in colder temperatures or at high altitudes, and some take more patience, but they also have their place. So check out that video for a full breakdown. We've used all of them, though as I said, I prefer a canister stove when backpacking with Josh or others, but one of the more ultra light options like an alcohol stove when I'm solo backpacking in order to to reduce the amount of weight in my pack. Plus, if it's just me, there's less water to boil, so there's less rush, and I'm happy to wait a few extra minutes in order to shave a few ounces. As for cooking equipment like pots and pans, there are literally dozens of varieties available. When Josh and I backpack together, we bring a GSI Pinnacle Duelist set. It's just a couple of bowls and a pot, plus folding sporks. And it all nests together with our backpacking stove in order to create a nice, tidy package. We also bring ultralight mugs for hot beverages. And that's it, because our cooking style in the backcountry strictly involves rehydrating. Because frankly, that method is lighter, easier, and doesn't require as much cleanup. When I'm on a solo trip, however, I sometimes opt for something a little smaller, namely an ultralight one-person pot and mug, possibly made of titanium or aluminum. No bowl, because I'll eat right out of the pot. I could cut weight even more by eliminating the mug, I have friends who do, but I like to sip my coffee in the mornings while I make breakfast, or enjoy my tea or hot cocoa in the evenings while I wait for dinner to rehydrate, so I bring both a pot and a mug. When you're choosing a cook set, you don't need much. Something minimalist and lightweight will do. Depending on what you are planning to eat, you'll probably only need one bowl. What that bowl is made of is totally up to you. There are plenty of options to choose from. For example, for several years, we just carried an ultralight kettle and two bowls. But we like the nesting set we have now, which reduces the amount of space our cook set takes up in our packs. But there are pots of all shapes, sizes, and weights, as well as plates and bowls. You can get silicone dinnerware that collapses flat, rigid plastic bowls, which are nice for not burning your hands, and metal bowls made of aluminum or titanium. You do just have to be a little more careful with those, because when you pour hot liquids into them, they can be extremely hot to the touch, so watch your fingers. But let's touch on doing dishes in the backcountry real quick, because there are a lot of misconceptions. For starters, not all soap is biodegradable, and biodegradable soap doesn't biodegrade in water. So choose your soap wisely and never do your dishes in a pond, creek, river, etc. When you do wash dishes, or wash your hands, do so at least 100 feet away from camp and 200 feet away from any natural water sources. I often bring a very small bottle of Castile soap if we're going to be doing dishes in the wilderness. Just make sure to scatter the dirty water 100 to 200 feet away from camp. If you have any leftovers, pack them out or bring along a buddy who can act as a human garbage disposal. Either way, never dispose of leftover food in the backcountry. That includes burning it. Just don't do it. When brushing your teeth after a meal, spit at least 50 feet from camp. Farther, if you're in grizzly territory, and imagine the kind of spitting you see in the movies when someone has water in their mouth and then gets surprised, as in put some water in your mouth, swish, then spit so you're distributing a fine mist of watered-down toothpaste over a large area. You know the kind of spitting I'm talking about. <coughs> you know. Leftovers or no, what should you do with food after you're done eating and before you go to bed? In most backpacking circumstances, you should prepare a bear hang for all of your food and smellables. And I do mean all of your food and smellables. That includes lip balm, sunscreen, deodorant, toothpaste, empty protein bar wrappers, anything that has a scent, even if you don't think it's that strong. Remember that animals' sense of smell is a whole lot stronger than ours. There are certain circumstances, of course, when a bear hang isn't entirely necessary. Sometimes I won't use one in winter when bears are hibernating and in areas of the country where bears are practically non-existent. 
but there are likely other mischievous creatures that wouldn't mind sneaking into your food bag for a free snack. So a bear hang is never a bad idea. To do one, place all of your food and smelly items in a stuff sack and seal it shut. Tie it securely with a piece of paracord or rope so that it can be held aloft without falling down or popping open. And make sure that length of paracord is at least 20 feet long because you're gonna have to hang the bag at least 10 feet above the ground. Listen, bears are taller than you think when they stand on their hind legs, okay? After you've tied the bag securely, toss the loose end of the cord over a strong, healthy tree branch. Keyword being strong and healthy. Make sure that the cord is hanging over the branch at least six feet away from the trunk of the tree. Then gently pull the loose end of the cord until your bear bag is hanging at least 10 feet in the air. Tie the loose end of your cord around the tree trunk to secure its airborne position. And you're done. Hang your bag at least 100 feet away from where you've pitched your tent. In grizzly territory, you'll also want to eat and do dishes at least 100 feet away from where you pitch your tent. In these areas, you should also do a bear hang anytime you are planning on leaving camp for more than about mm, 30 seconds. Listen, I've heard tales firsthand about people wandering down the trail just to refill their water and come back to a bear in their campsite rooting through their tent. I'm just saying, true story. It happens. So err on the side of caution and always hang your food when you leave camp or take it with you. Alternatively, and this is a better option if you're in grizzly country, sometimes even required, use a bear safe or bear canister. They are often heavy and bulky, but when tied to a tree trunk with all of your food are the best way to protect it from determined and powerful animals and ensure you still have food that's not smashed to pieces or eaten if a bear does wander by and gets curious. But we'll talk more about animals and animal safety in a few lessons. For now, that's how to eat well on the trail. So stay full and focused out there and wander on. I don't know about these. These bear bags, though, would like to say they're like chew proof, you know, they're like, oh, bear, bear teeth and claws can't get through them. So your food's protect. They're still going to be smashed. You're not going to have any food left. It's all going to be crumbs. I wouldn't, I wouldn't get one of those. That's my opinion. There you have it. Health and safety are obviously extremely important when you're on the trail, but especially in the backcountry, because you'll likely be several miles, if not several dozen miles away from help. So it's absolutely vital that you know how to take care of yourself and others hiking with you, and be sure that you're carrying the appropriate tools and medication to treat most injuries that may arise in the backcountry. But before we dive in, a disclaimer. I am not a medical professional, nor am I a wilderness first responder. The information in this lesson is meant to serve as guidance only, not health or life-saving advice. Okay? Okay. So let's start by talking about first aid kits. You really should never set out on any length of hike without a well-stocked first aid kit. Naturally, what is contained in a day hike first aid kit will not necessarily be the same as what should be in your backpacking first aid kit but there will be plenty of overlap. That said, there are a few extra items you wanna make sure to pack. A few of those include painkillers, adhesive bandages in several sizes, moleskin or some sort of blister treatment, alcohol wipes, antibiotic ointment, butterfly closures, burn ointment, itch relief cream and antihistamines, safety pins, gauze wrap, and a pair of nitrile gloves. Now that's the bare minimum, but together those things can treat most of the first aid situations that are gonna arise. As for things you don't need, I, I wouldn't bother with a bite or sting kit. You know, those things that claim to remove venom <laughs> because they absolutely do not work. Then there are items like tourniquet kits or splint kits for things like injuries that involve excessive bleeding and sprained or broken limbs, respectively. That's because in most cases, even experts agree that you can DIY a splint out of found materials like sticks or gear from your pack and tie it up with things like bandanas or spare clothing, which will be just as effective in an emergency situation. As for tourniquets, I would never carry one for a couple of reasons. One, because tourniquets should only be used in the most life-threatening situations, like when someone is in legitimate danger of bleeding to death. That is the only time you should ever use a tourniquet. Second, because a tourniquet can be made, once again, with 
found materials. Grab a stick, a shirt or bandana, and make your own. That said, if packing those two items makes you feel more comfortable, then bring them. There's nothing wrong with being overprepared, especially if you're not confident in your abilities to do it yourself. And while you may never need any of this stuff, and I hope that's the case, you should absolutely be prepared for the types of medical situations that might occur. The chief of which includes dehydration, heat illness, and hypothermia. Dehydration, not enough water, can happen quicker than you think. So can hyponatremia too much water. And the latter is often just as life-threatening as dehydration. To combat either, make sure to eat plenty of salty snacks as you hike, especially if it's hot outside, and drink electrolytes in addition to plenty of water. That can be in the form of Gatorade, electrolyte tablets like those from Noon that you add to your water bottle or reservoir, or powdered drink mixes like brands from Scratch Labs. In a pinch, you can even just pound a few salt packets, though that isn't gonna taste as nice. Whatever you do, don't think that all you need is water to get by. Plenty of hikers with liters of water still in their bottles have had to be rescued from places like the Grand Canyon because they were hyponatremic, full of water but not enough sodium in their blood. That can lead to fatigue, weakness, nausea, confusion, even seizures, similar symptoms as dehydration. So once again, for good measure, bring plenty of salt and electrolytes in addition to water. As for hypothermia, you may be more at risk than you think, especially if you or your clothing are wet, doubly so if you are in water. We've touched on this in the layering lesson, but again, I'll link to a science-based article I wrote about hypothermia below, but the key takeaways are this. If it's even cool out, do not stay in damp clothes and always keep a dry set of clothing in your bag and keep them dry as if your life depended on it, cause it might. If you start shivering and can't stop, one early sign of hypothermia, get dry, find shelter, and get warm as soon as possible. Eat a hot meal, go get in your sleeping bag, do whatever you can to warm up your body again. But let's move on to talking about hygiene for a minute, which is also important on the trail. And easy. Start by ensuring your hands are always clean before you cook or eat. Easy, right? We all know how to wash our hands at this point. At camp, though, that may mean breaking out a tiny bottle of soap and washing hands with soap and water away from natural water sources, of course. On the trail, carry a bottle of hand sanitizer or wet wipes and use them before you dig into that bag of trail mix. Because bacteria that lives on your hands can make you sick on the trail. In fact, one person who doesn't wash their hands before handling food can potentially give everyone in the group a bad case of E. coli. So when you pack your bag, don't forget hand sanitizer or wet wipes. You can also clean up the rest of your body with wet wipes. I like the kind from Ale or Ursa Major because they contain more natural ingredients, but still get the job done. Just remember that even if wipes say they're biodegradable, you should still pack them out. Don't bury them in your cat hole. But let's talk more about general safety because this is a big one. After all, we've all heard the horror stories of people getting lost in the wilderness, cutting off their own arms with a pocket knife, being found frozen under a pile of sticks, attacked by wild animals and left for dead, etc, etc. And while these are all tragic instances, let me assure you that these are extremely rare. In fact, you are far more likely to trip and fall to your death than be attacked by any wild animal, or have to cut off your arm with a pocket knife. I'll link to a few articles I've written about various animal encounters below, but suffice it to say that you have very, very little to worry about. What you should worry about is making sure that you can be found in the event that something does go awry. Say you get lost or you run out of food or sprain your ankle and can't make it out on your own. This can cause a lot of trouble if you're deep in the backcountry and don't have cell surface, which is common when backpacking. So the first thing you should always do when heading out on a backpacking trip or even a long day hike, especially if you're hiking alone or in a region that's new to you, is tell someone where you are going. Share your planned route and tell them when you plan to be back. Then let that person know when you return to the trailhead. That way, if they don't hear from you within a few hours of your scheduled rendezvous, they know it's time to call in search and rescue as something may have happened. So once again, <laughs> For good measure, always, always, always 
tell someone where you are going and when you'll be back. There are also a variety of safety tools available. Many backpackers who hike in desolate or avalanche prone regions often carry emergency beacons or satellite communication devices. They're expensive, but if the worst is to happen, they still have a way to call for help, even if there's no cell service or other people around. These are especially handy if you're planning on backpacking solo. You can also purchase tiny receivers from Reco Technology. Some gear even has it built in. There are little electronic chips that make you easier to locate by rescuers in the case of an emergency. Basically, if you go missing, Search and Rescue can use a RECO detector to emit a radio signal that bounces off of your receiver chip to help pinpoint your location. Cool, right? It's a more passive form of safety technology, but can bring a lot of peace of mind. The chips are sometimes built into jackets and backpacks, but you can also buy them separately and stick them to things like helmets, trekking poles, etc. Finally, sign up for a safety or first aid course. There are courses available for avalanche training, in-depth wilderness first responder courses, and general wilderness first aid classes. Sign up for one that suits your needs that takes place near you. At the very least, all of us could benefit from getting a CPR certification or taking a general first aid course. You may even be able to locate one at a Red Cross, REI, or Knowles outpost near you. Not only can they bring peace of mind when you head outdoors, but they could very likely save your life or somebody else's. At the very least, you'll know how to respond if you twist your ankle or get a paper cut. Those paper cuts in the outdoors, man. Whew, nasty. Nasty business. So stay safe out there, keep those cuts clean, and wander on. And we're back. But do you know where you're headed next? Or how to get there? Yep, we're talking about navigation. Now, we won't go super in depth with this topic here and now because frankly, orienteering is really quite involved and these skills often come with a significant amount of research, education, and practice. That said, you can and should have at least a base level of navigational skill before you head into the backcountry. So let's start by talking about tools, including our favorite way to navigate in the backcountry, digital maps and apps. We love tools like All Trails, Onyx Backcountry, and Gaia for their usefulness and precision. Sure, they can help you locate interesting hikes and know what to expect via reviews and photos like we mentioned in the trip planning lesson, but they also offer important details like hike distance, estimated time required to complete a route, elevation gain, and difficulty level. But more than that, they allow you to track your route, pinpoint your position, and even find campsites and alternate trails. Basically, apps like these make it much harder to get lost in the woods. I'm sure you can still do it, but it'll be more difficult. We almost always use one of these apps when hiking or backpacking. Even if the route is clear, familiar, or we know where we're going, it's fun to be able to see where you are, track your progress, and better estimate how far you have to go before you reach camp. Several of these apps even let you download digital maps for offline use when you don't have cell service or Wi-Fi in the backcountry, which is often. Most of them require you to purchase a pro membership to do so, but those fees are usually worth it in our opinion. That said, while we love a digital map and recommend them to every hiker, you should never just rely on a digital map when on a multi-day backcountry excursion. Why? <laughs> Batteries die, especially in the cold. Phones get dropped in the water. You could lose signal or your phone may simply stop working. So you don't want it to be the only way to navigate out of the wilderness. You should always have a paper map too. Depending on where you're headed, there are likely plenty to choose from, from park maps to locally produced maps, but a USGS or United States Geological Survey topographical map is always a solid choice and readily available at most outdoor stores, or you can order them online. Once you get a hold of a map, it's obviously important to know how to read it. Again, we're not going to get into every minute detail of map reading here, but there are a few map features you should absolutely be familiar with in order to plan and navigate a successful trip. Plus, anticipate what's to come and, you know, find your way. 
And it all starts with the map key, the little box usually in the corner of a map that details what different colors and lines mean, map info and scale, etc. Start by looking for the map scale and check the measurement in the key that shows how far a mile is in linear distance. You will reference this measurement often when wayfinding and route planning, so know where it is. For example, an inch may represent a mile on a map. So you look at the map, measure an inch along the line that marks the trail and voila, distance. But since trails usually aren't a straight line like a map scale key, here's a fun trick. Have a small piece of thread, string, or paracord tied somewhere to your pack or the map, a rubber band will also do, and lay it on top of the squiggly trail line on the map. Mark the beginning and end section by grabbing the string at those points with your fingers, straighten it out while holding it securely, and compare the string to the scale on the map key. Ta-da! You have a more accurate idea of how long the trail is from one point to another. Another important feature on maps is the topographical lines, or topo lines. Those are the light gray or green squiggly lines all over the map that indicate elevation change and what the landscape looks like. They're basically a 2D representation of 3D landscape. When you get good at reading topo lines, you'll be able to look at a map and tell immediately if you're hiking toward a ridge, a peak, a valley, a cliff, you name it. That's because all of the lines converge in specific directions to indicate topographical features. But more importantly, especially for beginners, they indicate elevation change. Each line, or rather the distance between them, signifies a measurement of distance. How much distance will depend on your map, so again, check the key to see if lines indicate elevation changes of something like 10 feet, 20 feet, 50 feet, or more, and then you'll have an idea of how much elevation you will be gaining or losing on a certain section of trail and how quickly. How? The closer together these topo lines are on the map, the steeper the terrain and the faster you will be ascending or descending. Lines that are very close together means there's a steep slope ahead. Lines that are spaced farther apart signify a more gradual incline or decline. These lines and the directions they curve can also help you identify geological features and where you are if you get turned around but they're also very helpful when it comes to trip planning. See, topo lines can help you anticipate how challenging a route might be and how much time it will take to complete it. A trail that goes up and down, or rather across many tightly smashed together topo lines, means you are in for a difficult hike, so plan accordingly. You'll know to pack extra food and water for the strenuous journey, set aside enough time to complete it before dark, and know that you're mentally prepared for what's to come between the trailhead and your campsite. Other map features that are important to be aware of include the compass and direction. See, maps aren't necessarily oriented with north at the top and south at the bottom. So look for the directional information, usually in the form of a printed compass that indicates how to orient your map correctly to determine north, south, east, and west. Then it's helpful to take note of directional changes as you curve down the trail throughout the day. If you have at least a rough idea of what direction you are and should be traveling, it can help you identify your place on the map. Once you get better at reading a map, you can start practicing more in-depth navigation and orienteering skills like bearing off. This will require a special orienteering compass. That level of navigational competence comes more in handy in true wilderness situations where there aren't well-marked trails or easy access to numerous trailheads, but it's still handy to know, even if you plan to stick to national parks or popular hiking areas. As for GPS units and devices, I'm gonna be honest here, I've never used them. If it makes you feel more comfortable and safe to backpack with a GPS device, then you should absolutely do what feels right for you. But unless you're going pretty far into true wilderness where there are no trails, trail markers, cell signals, or other people, it's often overkill for most adventures. But again, if you feel safer using one, I would never dissuade you from picking up a model. More important though, Practice reading a map and using one at home and on day hikes to get a feel for how to decipher their meaning. Practice makes perfect, after all. And this can not only aid in planning a successful trip, but managing expectations and finding your way. Plus, it can empower you to tell rescuers where you are in case of an emergency. So whoever you are, 
whoever you're with and however far you're going, learn how to read a map, bring a paper version with you and follow along the route as you hike to practice navigational skills and map reading. You'll be a savvy map reader in no time flat. Now conquer those topo lines and wander on. Seriously, there's, there's nothing quite like spreading out a map the first time, the hike you want to take, and looking at topo lines that are all two millimeters apart. Woohoo, <laughs> buddy. Uh, you know you're gonna be in for a treat, cause that sucker's gonna be steep. <laughs> but it's good to know. So, you know, don't be afraid to look. And you know, maybe warn your hiking companions as well that uh, they're in for some serious elevation change. Let's talk about animals in the outdoors for a minute. Because frankly, seeing an animal in the wild is without a doubt a thrilling and rewarding experience. We've seen black bears, moose, elk, mountain goats, marmots, you name it while well, we've been hiking and backpacking and every time it's just as exciting as the last. But animal encounters and sightings can turn scary quickly if you're not careful. Not often, mind you, but it does happen, so it's important to be prepared and know how to respond when you do cross paths with something big and potentially dangerous in the wild. And I'm not just talking about bears. True, they often get a bad rap as the scariest thing in the woods, but they aren't the only animal that can cause bodily harm. In fact, more people are injured by moose every year than bears. True story. So caution and care should be taken no matter what sort of animal you're hoping to spot outside. Or hoping not to spot. So let's start with the basics that apply to every animal you may encounter outdoors. First of all, and I've mentioned this in a previous lesson, never feed a wild animal. Period. A fed animal is a dead animal. That's for several reasons, which I only touched on in the previous lesson. First, human food can make animals very, very sick, and that can directly cause illness or death. But the more likely and unhealthy scenario is that when many people over a long period of time offer animals food, say the chipmunks at Zion or elk at the Grand Canyon, the animals become acclimated to human presence and food, so they begin to seek it out. That can lead to increased human-animal encounters, many of which can turn dangerous, if not deadly, when animals don't get what they want or get uncomfortable with how close people are to them and then attack. And when they do, that animal may have to be put down. Park service employees will often have to locate an animal that has become too acclimated to human presence and food and euthanize it because it's become a danger to the people who are visiting that area. And that's a real shame because we are visitors in their house and our actions shouldn't contribute to their death. When people feed wild animals, that can also disrupt their natural eating habits as well as their movements and wanderings, which means it has the very real potential to alter and shift their natural habitats, which may not have the food or shelter they require to live happy, healthy lives. So to recap, never feed a wild animal. Yes, even if it's adorable. Secondly, keep your distance from all wild animals. Yep, even the seemingly harmless ones. It's true that some animals have become so accustomed to human presence that they will walk right up to you without batting an eyelash. I've had quokkas in Australia sit directly on my lap. Chipmunks in Utah seek shade under my bent knees and deer walk straight toward me in campsites. This is an inevitable byproduct of heavily trafficked areas, unfortunately. Animals get used to us being there and therefore are no longer bothered by it. That said, you should always do your part to make room for animals, even if they seem to be seeking you out, and never ever be the one to do the approaching. Not sure what kind of distance you should keep? Use the rule of thumb, like your, your literal thumb. As in, stick out your thumb, extend your hand to arm's length, close one eye, and if your thumb doesn't cover the entirety of the animal in front of you, you're too close and you need to back it up. Again, I know sometimes this is unavoidable, like with squirrels, chipmunks, sometimes even deer, but when we're talking about animals like elk, buffalo, black bears, or other large creatures, you absolutely need to keep your distance. I mean, every year we hear about people getting tossed by bison in Yellowstone. 
moose charging people in Alaska and black bears protecting their young in the Pacific Northwest. Even deer can be potentially dangerous. So yes, as an animal lover, I absolutely understand the desire to get up close and personal with cuddly wild creatures. I mean, yes, Bears are freaking adorable. Moose looks so derpy and harmless. Elk so regal and majestic. But remember that this isn't Yogi, Bullwinkle, or Bambi we're talking about here. These are wild creatures whose home we are in, who we are likely frightening with our presence, and who may feel the need to defend themselves or their families. So if you want to see animals up close, bring your zoom lens or binoculars and enjoy them from a distance. But let's talk about a few animals specifically, because Let's be honest, most people who are new to the outdoors aren't worried about deer, chipmunks, or even moose. They're likely worried about larger threats like bears, mountain lions, or feral hogs. They're scary, okay? Let's start with bears, everyone's favorite wild animal to fear. For starters, fear is almost entirely unnecessary. There are only four to six fatal bear attacks across the United States every year. You are much more likely to get in a car accident on the way to the trailhead than you are to be attacked by a bear. So while you don't need to be afraid, you should be prepared and aware. And what to do if you do see one depends on the type of bear. Black bears, for example, are fairly docile, curious, and skittish. If you see one, your first course of action should be to make a lot of noise in order to scare the bear away by making it think it's not welcome and you are not interesting. Which is pretty hard for some of us. Because chances are, it's just as curious as to what the deal is with this strange looking biped. If shouting, banging pants, and waving your arms doesn't seem to be doing the trick to scare it away, then you should back away slowly, still making as much noise as you can and making yourself seem as large and unappealing as possible. You can even throw rocks or sticks if necessary. If the black bear keeps coming at you and charges, fight back. Black bears are more likely to leave you alone if they don't think you're worth the trouble. So if you start fighting back, it's very likely they'll give up and go away. If you encounter a grizzly bear, on the other hand, your first hope should be that the animal hasn't seen you. If you don't think it has, back away slowly and silently until you are out of sight, then get the heck out of there. If it does see you, talk to the bear calmly, quietly, and in a soothing voice, saying things like, hey bear, it's okay bear, hi bear, etc. Don't try to make yourself look big, don't make noise or wave your hands in the air, because you want to look as non-threatening as possible. While you speak to the bear softly, back away slowly and never take your eyes off the grizzly bear. Try not to make eye contact. If you are able to back around a bend in the trail where the bear can no longer see you, hightail it out of there. If it starts coming toward you, on the other hand, keep up the calm, quiet voice and continue backing away, as long as it's approaching slowly in which case it's likely just curious and still deciding what to do with you. If, on the other hand, it charges, do not run and do not fight back. Fall to the ground, curl up into the fetal position, protect your head and neck as best you can, and play dead. Grizzlies, unlike black bears, are less curious and more concerned with neutralizing the immediate threat. So if a grizzly thinks that you're dead, it's more likely to leave you alone. So play dead, stay very still, make as little noise as possible, and don't get up to run away until the bear has disappeared from sight entirely. Whatever the type of bear, if you are attacked, make sure to seek medical attention immediately. And don't let a fear of bears keep you from enjoying the outdoors. As for how to tell the difference between black bears and grizzly bears, grizzly bears have a much smaller footprint in terms of where in the world they live. So that's an excellent starting point. They don't live in most of the lower 48, though there are a few states they call home, like Montana. And while black bears tend to be smaller and grizzly bears larger, black bears aren't always black and grizzly bears aren't always brown. To help you figure out the difference, if you do see one, we will link to an article comparing the two in the lesson text below. But like I said, encounters with either are extremely unlikely and bears are not evil, aggressive animals out to get humans. They're simply animals doing what animals do, protecting their home and reacting to strangers who don't belong and probably frighten them as much as they frighten you. A few more notes on bears in defense. Bear bells don't work, so don't waste your money. Talking, singing, or making noise as you hike works much better. 
Josh and I did this the entire time. We were backpacking in Alaska, Canada, and the Pacific Northwest and didn't see a black bear or grizzly once. We did see evidence that they had been nearby though, likely because they heard us coming and got the heck out of there. Also, carry bear spray, especially in grizzly country. Sometimes that's required. It works on other animals too, but it's an effective defense tool. Better than a gun. In fact, studies show that you are twice as likely to suffer an injury from a bear if you try to shoot it than if you use bear spray. So, science. Next up, mountain lions. If you see a mountain lion on the trail, react in much the same way as you would with a black bear. Turn toward it, make yourself look big by waving your hands or trekking poles in the air, make a lot of noise, yell, and make yourself look aggressive and totally not worth the fight. After all, mountain lions look for prey that's vulnerable and weak. They don't want to have to put in more of a fight for their next meal than they absolutely have to. So if you look like you're going to cause some trouble, chances are a mountain lion is going to leave you alone. But if you do spot one that seems to be keeping its eyes on you, keep your eyes on it. Especially if you've tried to scare it away and it isn't backing off. In that case, make your way back to a trailhead and tell a ranger or post a sign warning of a mountain lion in the area. They're sneaky. If a mountain lion does attack, just like with a black bear, fight like hell. Use rocks, sticks, your fists, feet, trekking poles, anything you have at your disposal to fight back against the mountain lion. And fight like your life depends on it, because it might. But take heart. Because just like with bears, mountain lion attacks are extremely rare. In fact, if you even see a mountain lion in the wild, you should consider yourself pretty lucky. They don't show their faces willy-nilly. Not if it attacks you, that's definitely not lucky. But most people will never even see a mountain lion in their lifetime. As for other large animals in the wild, like boars, moose, elk, buffalo, bighorn sheep, etc. Just like the animals above, they're usually not interested in charging as long as you keep your distance. So stay back at least 50 feet. At least 100 if it's a carnivore. And if you do find yourself too close, your best course of action is often to hide behind trees or boulders, anything that puts a barrier between you and the animal. Most of the time, once they lose sight of you, they'll call off the attack. Every animal is different, of course, so if you want to read more about specific animals you're likely to encounter, like wild hogs in Texas, I'll link to a few articles I've written on the subject below. Whatever you do, don't feed wild animals, keep your distance, and know how to protect yourself. Oh, and you know, bring your zoom lens and wander on. And enjoy the heck out of that. Make sure you get a picture, man, because pictures or it didn't happen. You know how many people don't believe that I saw a puma on the side of the road in Canada because I didn't have a photo of it? I did. True story. 100%. Nobody believes me because there's no photo. You know why there wasn't a photo? Because I was driving. Come on. I mean, for real. You know what I haven't seen in the wild yet that I would really like to? is a grizzly bear, preferably from like across a river. And, you know, maybe when I'm hiking in the middle of the day, not when I'm about to like set up camp. Uh, but I, I, I would really like to see a grizzly. That would be cool. Big fluffy guys is what they are. Cute little cuddly babies. We've talked a lot about gear. But let's talk specifically about where to find sustainable gear. Because frankly, here at Terra Drift, we're all about adventure and exploration that does as little harm to the planet as possible and about doing our best to reduce the amount of impact we leave behind in the places we visit. And that includes what sort of gear we buy. Now, I'll be the first to admit that I am a gear junkie. I love new gear. Every time a new pack or tent or sleeping pad is released from a brand that I love, I want it. But constantly buying new gear is not only expensive, it's unsustainable. After all, most gear and outdoor clothing is made from synthetic materials that are a byproduct of petroleum and that require intense amounts of energy and resources and water and plastic and chemicals. Most components that go into this stuff release harmful substances and gases into the environment. But it's not just the new gear that's causing problems, it's the old gear too. In our disposable culture, we're used to just throwing things we don't want anymore into the garbage where it'll end up in a landfill. 
In fact, more than 9 million tons of textiles, including outdoor clothing and gear, goes to U.S. landfills every year. And since most gear is made of those synthetic materials, it breaks down and decomposes very, very slowly, sometimes leaching toxic chemicals like PFAs into the ground and waterways, which can cause health and environmental problems far outside the reaches of landfill property lines. That makes buying used gear, which has the joint benefits of keeping textiles out of landfills and negating the need to create new gear from virgin materials the most sustainable option. Now, hear me out. Used gear doesn't have to mean a backpack that's 20 years old and threadbare and falling apart. Often, aspirational outdoorists will buy products like clothing or equipment, use it a few times, decide they don't like it or aren't going to be camping or backpacking as often as they thought, and are just looking to get rid of it. Other times, people like me end up with too much gear that we've only used a handful of times but is not doing much good sitting in a gear closet somewhere. It makes a lot more sense if I release a tent or sleeping pad back into the world so that someone else can enjoy it and doesn't have to buy another brand new piece of gear. There are plenty of reasons people sell outdoor gear, of course, but the bottom line is that there's plenty of it available. And we always recommend looking for used versions of the items on your wish list before buying them new. You can do so on websites like REI Used, Gear Trade eBay or Craigslist, even Facebook Marketplace, or at local outdoor retailers with used gear sections, or even some that specialize in used gear. Those are my favorite. Even big brands like Patagonia and The North Face have dedicated used gear sections on their websites in order to encourage people to both recycle their gear and buy used. Long story short, there are plenty of places to find quality used gear. When you're looking to buy new gear, look for the most sustainable gear possible. That could be a jacket made out of recycled materials, a sleeping bag insulated with synthetic biodegradable insulation, a tent that doesn't contain fire retardant, outerwear with PFC-free DWR, or clothing that's not only recycled, but recyclable. Yup, I said clothing that's recyclable. Because the gold standard of sustainable manufacturing is recyclability. This is often very difficult to do, as clothing and gear is typically made up of many different materials that are hard to separate in order to recycle. So these items are still few and far between and do tend to cost more than their conventional counterparts, but are much kinder to the planet because they're manufactured in a circular way. Brands like Houdini and On make clothing that's recycled and recyclable. But if you can't find a recyclable product, the next best thing is to look for gear that's made of sustainable materials and built to last. In addition to the features that I mentioned, you can also look for specific certifications that indicate whether or not a product or brand is sustainable in one way or another. Things like a carbon neutral certification, or if a shirt is blue sign approved. All of these indicate that the brand took care in one way or another to reduce their footprint. We'll put a link to an article that kind of describes some of those certifications and the differences in sustainability terms in the course text below. So in addition to choosing sustainable gear, choose gear that's durable. Durability is relative, of course, depending on how you treat your gear, store it, and adventure with it. But generally speaking, the more durable and robust the fabrics that are used to make things like backpacks and sleeping bags, the longer they're going to last. You can also look out for gear made of recycled materials, like camp mugs made of recycled stainless steel, shoes, jackets, backpacks, and more. There are even sunglasses made out of recycled ocean plastic. These materials decrease the carbon footprint of each product, sometimes as much as half, which really adds up, especially as more outdoorists choose recycled products over products made with virgin materials. It's also worth looking into brands and their commitment to sustainability. I mean, just because a camp chair is made of recycled plastic bottles doesn't mean it's necessarily sustainable or that the brand that made it makes sustainability a priority. So check to see what brand's guiding principles are. Are they carbon neutral? Do they offset part or all of their manufacturing processes? Do they invest in social or environmental causes? Are they making efforts to reduce their footprint? Do they use sustainable packaging? Essentially, ask if sustainability is at the forefront of their mission statement. 
If it is, you can make a few assumptions about how that business operates and whether or not their goals align with yours for the planet and the future of climate change. And, you know, all of the outdoor places we love to play. There are plenty of other things to look out for when it comes to sustainable gear, of course, including undyed gear, natural and organic materials like cotton and hemp, which I already mentioned should be used judiciously when in the outdoors, and materials that are free from harmful chemicals like PFCs. So don't be afraid to do some research when it's time to gear up to find out what the most sustainable option is. And if at all possible, steer clear of products that could be considered disposable or throwaway items. Instead, invest in gear that's gonna last. And then do your part to stretch your gear's useful life as long as possible by taking care of it. If you wanna keep your used gear in action for years and years, stick around. The next lesson is all about gear repair. Empowering, right? So gear up sustainably and wander on. Blue sign and climate neutral and circular and recycled and ocean plastic. So many things, so many things. It does require a lot of research. I'm not gonna lie, but you can do it. It's not that hard. We'll put a bunch of links in the course description, okay? And that way you can just clicky, clicky, click, read up, learn all kinds more stuff if you want to, and be on your merry way with, you know, like more sustainable gear, yay. When it comes to gear and sustainability, the most sustainable thing we can do with our gear, whether we bought it new or used, is to keep it in play and out of a landfill as long as possible. That means taking care of it so it lasts, repairing it when we can, but also letting someone else give it new life when we're through with it. Let's talk about all of it. Obviously, we absolutely love shiny new sustainable brands and gear that is made of materials that are better for the planet from brands who care about their footprint and that promise to last for years. But the absolute best way to make sustainable gear choices is to keep using the gear you already have. It reduces the number of virgin materials required to create new gear, but also keeps older materials that don't readily biodegrade out of landfills. Win-win. But how do you keep using old gear when it's starting to show its age? Repair it, of course. We'll show you how to repair outdoor gear in this guide to basic outdoor gear repair and maintenance, including what to do with tattered, torn, peeling tents, jackets, sleeping bags, shoes, and more. And it all starts with proper storage and maintenance. The number one way to maintain gear? Wash it. <laughs> Why, yes. Yes, you can wash your outdoor gear. Tents, sleeping bags, outerwear, you name it, should all be washed on a regular basis. A general guideline I like to adhere to is that after every four or five times you take your gear out, you should give it a good cleaning. More often, if you're taking extended excursions or trips to especially dusty or muddy places where dirt and grime can damage finishes, jam zippers, and gunk up fabric. That said, your sweat can really do a number two. Even bug spray can eat at waterproof coatings. So start by giving your gear a good wash every now and then. Do be careful to follow manufacturer instructions for the item, but also choose a cleaner design for outdoor gear. While regular laundry detergent is often fine for synthetic clothing and sleeping bags with no water resistant coatings, down gear needs special detergent, as do tents and items with waterproof coatings like rain jackets and shells. For that stuff, we like a special gear wash, like one from Nick Wax, which not only cleans our gear, it's also great for sleeping bags, but refreshes that waterproof coating too. After you wash your gear, if jackets or tents aren't shedding water like they used to, you may not need to replace it yet. It might just need re-waterproofed. Rain jackets, snow pants, tents, and more naturally lose water repellency over time. So follow up a wash with a wash in or spray on water repellent designed with your specific piece of gear in mind, which will make waterproof items and outerwear like new again, so you can just watch the rain roll right off. There are even products available that contain UV protectants, which can make gear like tents last years longer. Once you've washed and re-waterproofed your tent, it may still need a bit more attention. Say if the PU coating on the tent floor or fly or seams is peeling or sticky. Fortunately, it's an easy fix. Peel off the pieces of coating or seam tape that are already coming off and use a tent fabric sealant on the areas that need to be sealed. All it takes is one coat applied to the inside of the item, not the side exposed to the elements. Then just let it dry and voila, 
old peeling fabric and seams are resealed. Moving right along, we all have that one zipper, or at least one, probably, that's always sticking or catching or just doesn't slide like it used to. Now, while replacing zippers in gear is one of the more technical and time-consuming fixes and likely needs to be sent to a manufacturer to be repaired or replaced, you can absolutely clean and lubricate your zippers. For that, just get yourself some zipper lubricant, which can restore them to their pre-sand dune camping, seaside wandering zippiness. Just brush it on, give the zipper a few quick back and forth pulls, and you're good to go. We've used it plenty of times to repair outdoor gear, including on our favorite day packs that get used and abused often. Now, when gear gets rips and holes and tears, there's no need to fret. It happens. Ultralight gear is especially susceptible as it doesn't tend to be as hardy as denser, heavier fabrics. But just because your tent floor suffered a puncture or your sleeping bag or puffer coat is shedding insulation from a hole a branch poked in it doesn't mean it's reached the end of its usefulness. Patch it. Patches and tape come in all shapes and sizes from rolls so you can cut pieces to size to little rectangular to-go patch kits to special patches for mesh, even super fun and quirky shapes like stars or s'mores or Bigfoot so you can have a little fun while repairing your outdoor gear. We've patched tent floors, flies, coats, sleeping bags, and more, and they're now good as new and more unique to boot. Fun fact, there are entire communities out there that specialize in and celebrate fun, funky, and unique gear repair. So if you want some inspiration, search for hashtags like Warnware on social media. We bet it'll inspire you and give you a few ideas of your own, even if you think something is too far past its prime. Now, if you've discovered a tear forming on the edge of, say, an inflatable sleeping pad or near a seam on your tent, then you might want to reach for some sealant. While you can use adhesive patches on most tears or holes, some, like on or near seams or in awkward positions like by an air valve or zipper, are a little tricky as they don't allow a smooth, flat surface for sealing and sticking a patch. An adhesive sealant works better. We recently used it on a rain jacket whose external shell was peeling away from the pockets around the zipper. We glued the fabric back together and it seals out water and still allows for stretch and movement. And now we don't need a new rain jacket. Boots and shoes are a little more hands-on. They can't usually be put in a washer, but they also get dirtier faster than any other piece of clothing or equipment. Fortunately, there's still a way to not only clean them, but re-waterproof hiking boots as well. Use something like a boot care kit or shoe cleaner to scrub damp shoes. If your boots are leather, you may need a dedicated leather cleaner. Then, once they're clean and while still damp, spray on water repellent designed for boots and shoes to add a whole new layer of waterproofing. As soon as they're dry, they should be good to go. And more water resistant than when they were caked with mud. Outdoor gear repair and maintenance isn't difficult, and it should most definitely be part of your regular routine. Even if you only break out your tent and other gear a couple of times a year, you should give it all a good cleaning and repair check annually at the very least. Why? It will almost certainly make your beloved gear last longer, which means less synthetic material in the landfill, fewer new materials that need to be manufactured, and a whole lot of money that can stay in your wallet since you won't have to drop a few hundred bucks on a new tent. You're welcome. An extra bonus? You can buy used gear that might be in less than perfect condition, like at REI garage sales or websites like geartrade.com, with confidence, knowing that you can repair those little things. So arm yourself with knowledge and refresh your gear closet. Don't renew it for the most sustainable gear on the planet. And when you're ready to retire a piece of gear, if it's still in usable condition, consider selling it on a used gear site like Gear Trade, REI Used, uh, which is for members only, by the way, or platforms like eBay, Craigslist, or Facebook Marketplace. You might get a few bucks out of it, but you'll also likely make someone's day. So repair. Don't replace, and sell and or donate your gear when you're done with it. And that pack will last a long, long time. So patch it, and then take it back out there and wander on. Yeah. See what I did there? You patch it, and then you take it out. It's patched now. Seriously, a Bigfoot patch. I have one. I do. I have a, I have a pine tree in my sleeping bag. I have little mountains on my Patagonia Puffy. Patches, patches everywhere.
patches, patches, patches. I have so many patches just like ready and waiting to cover holes and stuff. I take them with me on every backpacking trip just in case. They're great. Patches. They're the best. So freaking cheap. So cheap. There's no reason not to have a bunch of patches just sitting around waiting. You know what, now that I'm thinking about it, I do believe there is a tiny hole in my backpack that may require a patch. I'm thinking squirrel? Squirrel. Let's do squirrel. Yeah. Physical training. Exercise. Yeah. Let's talk about physical training and fitness because being in good shape can make every trip more enjoyable. But right up front, anybody can backpack. You don't have to be in amazing physical shape or lose 25 pounds before your first trip or have rippling muscles or have hit the gym for six months leading up to the hike. Backpacking is for everyone of any body type. Sure, if you aren't in awesome shape, an aggressive itinerary and terrain isn't going to be as enjoyable as if you've trained your body to prepare for it, but backpacking is as much a mental fitness game as a physical fitness game. And if you're ready to push yourself, then do it. Just don't let anyone suggest that you're too old, too overweight, too sedentary, or too whatever to start backpacking. Just get out there and do it. Worst case scenario, you simply have to hike at a slower pace and tackle less ambitious mileage. Big deal. But that's only a negative if you think it is. And the success of every trip certainly doesn't have to be measured in distance and time. Success depends on you, your goals, and what you hope to accomplish out there. And frankly, making it back to the trailhead in one piece, which physical fitness can help ensure. So let's talk about it because having at least a baseline level of fitness can absolutely make your time on the trail, especially if it includes challenging terrain, more enjoyable and rewarding. Now, you can take pre-trip training to whatever extreme you deem necessary, but for most people and most trips, an active lifestyle will provide a solid fitness base for many adventures. If you don't live an active lifestyle in which you routinely exercise, whether that's running, walking, hiking, lifting, cycling, or I don't know, Krav Maga, then you may want to consider doing a bit of training at least a month or two prior to your trip. And training can look different depending on who you ask. I am not a trainer, so I will not advise you on specific movements or training programs, but I've spoken and worked with trainers before, so can pass on their advice to you. Also, we'll link to a few trainers and programs in the notes below if you prefer to adhere to a stricter regimen. That said, any activity is good activity, but hiking is probably the best activity. If you can, in the month or three leading up to your backpacking trip, start taking a few more hikes than you usually would wherever you live. The more challenging, the better. After a few, or if you're already in pretty good shape, start loading a bit of weight into your backpack and hike with 15 or 20 pounds. That'll help prepare your legs, core, and shoulders for the load you'll be carrying on your trip. If frequent hikes aren't an option where you live, say in an urban environment, or if you have a really demanding job, the next best alternative is walking on a treadmill set on an incline or even a Stairmaster. In either case, don't use your hands to help pull yourself up via the display on the front of the machine. That makes all the time you put in practically worthless. So hands down, folks. Then just like if you were hiking, after a week or so, add a backpack with a bit of weight in it to simulate what the walk will be like on the trail. If you don't have access to a hilly neighborhood, then just go ahead and load that backpack up with 15 or 20 pounds from the get-go and take longer walks than you might be used to to get your body familiar with the weight and movement of long, heavy hikes. If you do have access to a gym or weight equipment, add in strength training too. It's safe to focus mostly on your legs and core with exercises like squats, deadlifts, step downs, step ups, box jumps, planks, bear crawls, then throw in some back, core, and shoulder exercises for good measure. After all, your back and shoulders will be doing most of the hauling. Picking up and putting down a pack repeatedly will be much easier if you've built up some strength in your arms and core. But even if you don't have access to that gym equipment, you can do many of these exercises as bodyweight exercises. 
they will still help you prepare for the hike ahead. If you're planning an especially big or difficult hike, say with lots of elevation change, adventures longer than a few days, or you're hiking at high altitudes or in really hot temperatures, you may wanna start training earlier than one or two months. Training for at least three can make hikes like these more enjoyable and less painful. For example, I attempted to hike the Pemigewasset Loop in the White Mountains one summer with almost no training. I had been quite active, but hadn't been doing much strength training or hiking. This is a notoriously difficult route. And as a result, though I was in relatively good shape, the hike proved exceedingly difficult and as such much less enjoyable than if I had started my training a month or two or even three in advance. Bottom line, never underestimate the power of repeated elevation change to really give your body a beating. And do as much as you can to prepare your body beforehand for a more pleasant experience overall. And yes, I will be going back to visit the Pemigewasset Loop very soon. It's not gonna beat me, so train your body to handle anything the terrain can throw at it and wander on. I'm just doing squats back here behind the table. Hold on.